Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's meeting. This is a public uh, meeting and members of the public and press are permitted to report on the proceedings. Reportings include filming, photography, making an audio recording and providing commentary on proceedings. Uh, please note this meeting is recorded and streamed live. These recordings are published on the relevant meeting page of the Council's website. And by choosing to uh, attend the public meeting, you are deemed to have given your consent by to be to being filmed or recorded or for any footage to be broadcast or published. If the alarm sounds, the premises must be evacuated immediately. Do not spend time collecting personal belongings. All emergency escape routes are clearly signed. Once you have left the building, the assembly point is on the high street opposite the Guild Hall. Members and other speakers are reminded to use their microphone when speaking. I'm conscious that it's the first time I've seen many of you since the New Year, so Happy New Year to all of you. We have a long uh, agenda. We welcome our guests this evening, Madeleine Nielsen, Chief Operating Officer of Citizen Housing, Peter Gill, Director of Housing Care and Support at Citizen Housing, uh, John Newey, CEO of Worcester Community Trust, and hopefully David Rushton, uh, Associate Director of Sports and Leisure for Freedom Leisure, who will be joining us at 8 o'clock. So we'll take uh, appointment agenda item one, appointment of substitutes. Chair, yes, we do have two substitutes this evening. Uh, that's Karen Lewing. Uh, Karen's here for Neil Lawrence this evening. Steve Cochran is here for Tom Petrosky. Thank you. Welcome to the meeting. Uh, item number two, declarations of interest. Julian, if you record an interest from mine, Perryfields Community Association, it's mentioned the grants awarding list. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, item number three, public participation. None, it's fine. And item number four is the minutes of the previous meeting. We can go by page by page. Page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six, page seven. Would we'll take those as a true and accurate record. Three. Thank you. As a noted. Okay. Agenda item five then is uh, the annual citizen housing update. Welcome to uh, Citizen for uh, being with us today and providing this report. Lloyd, do you want to introduce this or is it Tom? Tom, Tom. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I won't take up too much time um, uh, this evening. Uh, I'm conscious that uh, members are most likely keen to hear from Madeline and, and Peter themselves. Uh, but just by way of introduction, really, um, Citizen are a, a key uh, provider of social housing in the city. Uh, the second largest provider um, of social housing in Worcester um, and they own approximately one, one and a half thousand properties. Um, they're a key um, key partner in this in, in the response to uh, delivering affordable housing uh, in meeting the needs of uh, the residents of Worcester City um, in the provision of social housing. Um, I don't want to take away any of your thunder um, so I propose handing over to, to Madeline and Peter Chair. Oh, sorry, thanks, Peter. <laughs> Glad to keep it pressed down. Um, yeah, so we've, we've got a short presentation, if that's okay. Um, first of all, thanks, thanks for inviting us and giving us this opportunity to talk to you about Citizen. Um, yeah, a few slides. Um, don't know how much people know about Citizen. Um, so we just wanted to give you just a little bit of background to the organisation first of all. Then Peter's going to focus more specifically on um, Worcester and what we do in Worcester and what we have been doing in Worcester. And then I'm going to come back in at the end and just talk through through some of our some of our priorities. Happy to take any questions. Um, we've kind of done a little bit of research and just checking some of the numbers and facts, obviously ahead of ahead of the meeting. But if there is anything that we can't answer, we'll we'll get in touch with Tom and we can provide that information after the meeting if that's okay. Okay, brilliant. See if this works, Julian. Yeah, brilliant. Um, it's the usual, probably some 
quite old photographs on there, um, touched up and Peter's a bit squashed. Um, so again, again, I don't know how much you know about, about the organisation. So Chief Exec is Kevin Rogers. Um, Kevin's been with the organisation um, 20 years, I think now. Um, Gary Booth, Chief Finance Officer, um, and Nick Byrne, my colleague, who's the Exec Director of Development. I joined about 18 months ago um, as Chief Operating Officer and Peter is the Director of Housing, uh, Care and Support, so Peter, Peter works as part of my team. A little bit um, about the background again to the organisation, because I'm not sure kind of how familiar people are. Um, and um, that, that just, I suppose, gives a little bit of a timeline to how we've arrived at Citizen. Um, I think specifically for Worcester, um, it would have been Nexus Housing Association, I think, at the time, um, <clears throat> that would have just been in Worcester. Nexus merged, as lots of other associations have done, merged with a number of associations at the time, I think became West Mercia. Um, West Mercia then joined uh, the White Fri Whitefriars organisation, came together, big amalgamation um, that then created Citizen back in 2019. Probably as a result of that, um, and, and particularly because of a couple of years we've had a little bit of that impact around COVID, I'd probably say there's, there's still a little bit of integration still happening across the organisation. Um, and that's, that's probably more around some of the kind of service delivery and making sure that we're doing things kind of in a standard way across the organisation. Might still be a little bit of differences between, um, yeah, kind of what we do in Coventry as opposed to kind of what we do, what we do in Birmingham. Um, but hopefully that gives you kind of a little bit of, of, of the history and who citizen, who citizen are. A little bit on the governance structure, because um, prior to creating citizen, um, and, and again, I don't know how much people know about housing associations who, who, who merge with lots of other associations. I think for some time, um, they were all quite separate subsidiaries. So there was probably a kind of a local board that would have covered the Worcester and, and Hereford area. When we did the amalgamation and created Citizen, we kind of collapsed all those organisations. Um, for, for good reason, I suppose, in that it just creates some of that efficiency in running the organisation instead of having 200 board members, you know, we've got a board of 12 um, and then created some of those um, committee structures to, to support it. So <clears throat> we have a new homes board, so that's the subsidiary part that does all of our new developments. We have the audit and risk committee. Um, the Citizen Treasury Board is, is all around how we kind of bring in that funding to the organisation to, to deliver the programme of new build. Enumeration Committee, and over the last 18 months or so, we've um, really beefed up our kind of um, customer co-regulatory structures and tenant customer involvement. That was probably a little bit of a gap in the organisation, especially when we came together to create Citizen. So we now have a customer assurance committee that's made up of 10 customers. Um, I think I'm pretty sure two members are from, from, from Worcester as well. In addition to that, last year we created the customer scrutiny panel as well. So that feeds directly into the customer assurance committee and into board. So <clears throat> it's all part of our formal, formal governance, governance structure. Hot, hot off the press, these. Um, these are some of the, the revised um, corporate objectives that, that were probably um, likely to launch um, post, post March. Quite similar to um, the, object, the current objectives, but I think a little bit nuanced. Um, so that first one is, is around investing in homes. Um, it's really important for us to do two things, and that's investing in existing homes. We've got 28,000 um, properties, a big chunk of that um, is more than 10, year, more than 10 years old. Um, different issues in Worcester to Birmingham to Coventry. Um, so we've got a big, a big plan around um, really tailoring some of that investment and making sure we've got that fully funded over the next 10 and 30 years within, within the plan. 
Equally, um, we want to be there providing new homes and meeting housing need um, across, across the region. So that's really important that we're kind of balancing both of those and we're not just doing one, one without the other. Lots of issues and I think in part um, why we created the Customer Assurance Committee and Scrutiny Committee and we've kind of really ramped up lots of our customer engagement um, routes to again kind of really ramp up the customer voice in the organisation and make sure that we're listening to customers acting on that, that feedback and that's going to be um, a really big focus and a big priority for us over, over the next couple of years. Third one um, is really around um, as, as a large employer um, and um, housing people who perhaps need greater support needs than others, perhaps some of the most kind of vulnerable households in particular areas, we really want to make sure that we're having maximum impact that we can have. So that's about linking in with other organisations, it's about signposting organisations. Um, signposting our customers to other organisations but also I think we covered in the report some of the things that we do around the hardship fund, money advice service um, and some of our apprenticeship uh, programmes so it's about making sure that we can do the best that we can and kind of maximise maximise that impact. Just before I hand on to Peter to talk a little bit more about local issues for you guys this is just some 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 of the stats then um, that, that we've done over the last the last 18 months or so. So that's new build programme, um, not so much in Worcester, and we can talk about talk about that and some of the constraints that, that we've had, but certainly in neighbouring neighboring, um, local authorities, uh, we've, we've targeted some of that new build investment. Lots of regeneration, but that tends to be Coventry, um, as you can probably imagine, lots of different issues that we've got with our, our homes over in Coventry. Customer satisfaction, um, we score really high when customers contact us and actually receive a service. We don't score so well in terms of perception, so what customers think about citizens generally. So that's going to be a big focus for us again over, over the next two years or so. Um, and um, putting ourselves on the map, this was um, an objective that was around supporting local authorities to deal with homelessness and kind of tackle homelessness. And that's something that we've done, um, particularly with, with you guys, guys around the rough sleeping accommodation programme. Um, and as part of our supported housing strategy, something that we, we, we definitely want to carry on doing across the region. Hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea about the organisation and Peter's just going to talk through some of the Worcester yeah. specifics. As Mads has already told you, um, we, we, we've been in the city a long time. We, we go back even further than Nexus. If some of you have been here, we might, might remember Worcestershire Housing Association set up back in 1974. So we have a long commitment to Worcester. Um, we've got around about, as it says up there, around about 1,300 properties, mainly um, houses, flats, um, and a mixture really for families, couples and single people. Uh, and we let most of our properties through the um, Housing for You, which is Worcester City's um, choice-based letting system. So we're very much a partner of helping to, as Mads said, um, help homeless families, but also um, people in um, housing need in the city. Uh, we've particularly looked at um, energy efficiency. Um, the good news here in, in, in Worcester is most of the stock is um, got an EPC level, an energy rating level of C and above, and the government is trying to get all social housing up to grade C by 2030. So we're ahead of the trail here in Worcester, and obviously we're committed to a further investment ensuring um, that our properties are the most efficient, energy efficient they can be, because we're aware that our customers are telling us that energy costs are, uh, are a big issue for them. Um, following on from that, we have fairly young, compared to the rest of our stock, we, as Matt said, we've got 30,000 properties, but the stock here in Worcester is fairly, fairly modern uh, and it's in relatively good condition. So while we have a big commitment um, to wanting to, to maintain that and improve that stock and not just around the physical attributes of the building, but also the environment where people are living. So it's about how you feel about your neighbourhood, um, which we're, again, we're picking up from customers are saying it's just as important about the physical nature of their property. So we've, um, 
we've um, got a, say, a, mainly a mixture of traditional housing. We don't have any sort of system built or any kind of unusual type of housing. It's very traditional. No high rise for us here either. Um, so um, we've, we're just reviewing our asset management strategy. Um, we're just going through that. I and mean, today we met with our customers to talk through um, what that will look like and what should be in there and giving them an update on what we're doing. So uh, we're, we're constantly updating our stock condition survey. So we've got a team of people based here in Worcester who again are going out and looking at the properties to make sure that they're picking up and feeding into that overall asset strategy. Um, again, we are a local provider. We have a local office. Many of you might have been there to Apex um, House, which is on what Wainwright Road, just by Junction 6. Um, again, we offer from that office a whole range of housing management services, whether that's neighbourhood offices who will do that sort of housing, direct housing management with customers. We have an income team that's based there, as well as an allocation team. So we allocate Worcester properties from Worcester. Uh, and, and we're committed to that. Uh, we also recognise that customers um, sometimes, especially with transactional, what, want to do business in a slightly different way. So we do have a customer service centre uh, that people are routed through. And then there's also uh, an online offer which we're looking to develop. So people can do that kind of stuff. You just want to pay your rent. You just want a bit of information you, or you want to tell us about something. You can go online and do that fairly quickly. But we recognise that housing can be an emotive. You know, if, you, if you're in housing need or you've got an issue with your family, you might sometimes want to talk to people uh, and you don't want them to come and see you. You don't necessarily want to talk to a contact centre. So what we're trying to do is make sure we blend the right way so people have those options um, that they can get the stuff done when they need to get it done, but also when they need to have a face, when they want to talk to their landlord about something that they can call on them and we will come and see them. So we, I say we're committed to that. Uh, the last major development, um, probably the largest development, was in was the porcelain factory in Diglis. That, and since then, um, um, development has been tough for us here in, in, in Worcester City. And that's been a combination of factors around land availability um, and also, um, you know, the, the competition. You know, whether Section 106 sites that we be mainly looking to develop here in, in Worcester City. These are the social landlords that we're looking to also compete against as well when we're going for those so and again more recently our commitment has, has, has been around homelessness and we brought forward the three rough sleepers, three rough sleepers accommodation that have come into play um, to help those people who have perhaps have, have, have been through the system more than once and it's an opportunity for them to, to press the reset button and housing is an integral part of doing that so you too oh yeah sorry um there's a bit of, um, on the next slide, it's very difficult for you to see really. It's just um, showing about the, um, the accommodation type uh, of where our stock, 93% um, of our stock is uh, for general needs housing. That's for, as I said, for families, couples, and single people. And we have a small um, um, co uh, cohort or portfolio of supported housing. Most of, uh, over 52% of our accommodation is housing uh, with 41% flat, so again, um, uh, you know, a high number of, 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 profit, of, of um, houses, houses in, as part of that stock, and then a residual amount of bungalows and bed sits. The bed sits are mainly in one scheme, yeah, uh, which uh, members may be aware of, called Vicarage Court, which is right in the centre by Asda, right in the centre of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a small portfolio, a set of um, supported housing that consists of Lowesmore Retirement Living Scheme. Uh, Dickinson Court, which provides um, support to primarily for people with head acquired brain injuries and mental health. And then we have an Exbury Place, which is for uh, customers with learning disabilities. And the final um, supported housing project is a women's age refuge um, also in the city. Um, if we move on, um, this is a slide showing, it's again, it's very hard to see, but hopefully um, we'll get it updated to reflect um, um, the full um, numbers. Um, that shows really where, the, where, the, where, where citizens' properties are. And um, as I say, um, the bedrooms, so if you look at the bedroom size slide, again, it's quite hard to do. 30% of those are three bedroom houses, um, and 38% um, are two beds, and 23% are one bedroom accommodation. Uh, the final table, um, I think, on there, if we move on is talks about our rents and then sets them and our service charges. 
Um, more recently, we've done, uh, as you will be aware, that the rent increase has been in, in much in, in debate over the last months with, because it's governed by CPI plus 1%, and the government looked at those figures and rightly said that wasn't right to um, be putting rents up by 11.1%. At the same time, our costs have gone up by 11.1%. So there's, there, is a, there is a gap there. So we've been looking about how we compare right across our, our stock. And when we look in Worcester in particular, we think we compare very favorably to other social landlords. So our rents aren't outliers compared to other social landlords in the, cities, in the city. What we've also done, um, our rent increases will be 7% this year. Uh, which means that um, as a landlord, we're going to have to pick up 4.1% of additional costs, um, which won't, we won't be able to recover in, um, through, the rent, rent, through the rent increase. What we're also doing is when we're, when we're telling people about the rent increase is making sure they're aware of what help and advice is available. So we'll be inserting in those rent increase letters about how they can get help from us um, or how they can get help from um, other agencies. And this last year, we've, in, we've um, invested again in our help and support. We've created um, two new energy advisor posts to do a bit of casework, but also to provide some general advice to people about how they can reduce their bills. We've got an animation. Uh, we we recognise that not everybody um, wants to read stuff. Not every, we can't get around and talk to everyone in person. So we've created an animation so people can look at some of the top tips about how they can look at reducing their bills. Um, we've also now, um, as, um, every new tenant um, to citizen gets a face-to-face -face, um, money advice session because we recognise that while people, not everybody needs to maximise their income when they first join us, what we want to try and do is establish a relationship with them really early on so they know that we're here to help. So if they ever do get into, uh, into difficulties with paying their rent, they'll have had that, they'll know what kind of services we offer, they'll know that we're open to talking about them and we've tried to help them before. So our whole approach is getting in early. We um, try and talk to people who are in difficulty really early. And then um, similarly, any, all new UC cases, we contact within 24 hours if you're in, in receipt of universal credit. And we get uh, a 65% hit rate. So most people, and when they run, if they get into universal credit, want to talk to us. And then we're able to establish a relationship to make sure um, they're getting the right advice and support. Uh, and, how, and if they have some existing arrears, how we can help them. So we've really tried to get in very early by having conversations, by offering a whole range of advice and support. So thanks. Good okay, to brilliant. You. Yeah, back to me. Okay, just to <coughs> just to finish off then. Um, <clears throat> so so priorities for us, which will extend um, across to um, operations in Worcester, are around kind of getting even better um, at that customer service so improving customer satisfaction greater engagement with customers using that insight to to, to kind of really improve improve what we what we do um, building safety probably less of an issue here in terms of the new legislation that that, that came in um, post post Grenfell because that was more about um, 18 18 meters and above tower blocks but I suppose for building safety, it, that then captures all of the landlord compliance activity. So gas servicing, electrical testing, we've carried out lots of improvements on that over the last the last two years or so. Um, so that's about kind of making that um, kind of more um, kind of applicable to our customers so that customers understand why we need to do that and that we're able um, to gain access to, to property. So that's that's all of that stuff around landlord compliance and, and safety in the home. Mentioned at the beginning um, that it's really important to us to invest in our um, existing homes. So Peter mentioned new asset strategy. Um, so that's going to look at tailoring um, that investment across all of our operations. So looking very specifically at the needs in Worcester, what we need to do, some of that is largely driven by some of the environmental improvements that we need to do around some of some of our estates. Providing new homes, um, so, so that's 2,200 homes by 2023, not 2,200 homes in 2023. So that was like a four, a four year target. Um, so kind of going forward, it, it's that 550 um, per, per year that, that we're looking to 
um, provide, and that's been built into our, our financial plan. And then again, as Peter said, um, covered off the energy and carbon reduction in a fairly good place here in terms of um, the energy efficiency of our homes, more than we, we can do, and particularly getting ourselves ready for um, net, net zero um, targets um, and really looking at some of those alternative heating systems, ensuring that properties are, um, are kind of watertight and focusing on some of those um, issues that we've got perhaps around insulation um, and replacement of kind of windows and doors. So really looking to make sure that that is very geographically focused and we've got local plans um, that we can talk through with our with our customers and, and how that's going to get delivered. So hopefully that gives you an idea of Citizen, a bit more information about um, our presence in, in Worcester um, and then some of the priorities for us over, over the next 12 months. Thank you. Thank you, Madeleine. Thank you, Peter, for that um, comprehensive report. I'll open it up to the floor now for members to ask uh, questions. Um, Councillor Sarah and then can Karen Lewin, Councillor Lewin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've had a fair number, amount of dealings with your local people uh, in, in my ward of Warndon. And I think I've got quite a good relationship with them now. They've done some really good work. Um, they've also been involved in a, um, a cost of living task and finish group subgroup that I've been on, easy to say, um, trying to look at the ways in which the major housing providers could help people with their energy savings during this cost of living crisis. And I have to say that Citizen's response to that was one of the best. Yeah, very good. Um, lots of information for people, lots of help. Um, and, you know, the offer of doing the um, energy um, assessments, I think, was yeah, marvellous. Very good. Also, um, I was asking particularly for two things. This is quick fixes where letterbox covers are removed or are missing. Could they be replaced? Um, and that immediately came back. You said that's a repair. Just, you know, book it in, it'll be done, which is great. But it wasn't necessarily the response I got everywhere, so that was good. Um, and also, um, the offer of uh, foam insulation strips. Of, I'm, I'm no DIY, but I think you can buy this stuff in home base, and it's very thin, and you can stick it on yourself. So if you do have a window that's a bit gappy, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, a quick fix to do, um, your guys have agreed to provide a stack of it um, to be picked up by a, a central place. So... Again, I have to work out where that place is, but at least it's there <laughs> and working on that. So all of those things are really, really good and positive. Uh, I'm also impressed with um, a lady called uh, Claire Tumulty, who's recently joined, I think, uh, it certainly come to this area. Her plans for some of the environmental areas of, of, of the houses in my ward are very, very good, like knocking down obsolete garages, and whilst the ground's all disturbed, putting heat pumps in to save people money. So, I mean, lots of really good things like that. However, of course, <laughs> um, the call centre. Yeah. It's really not... Not great experience. No, no. And it, not just for me, because I do ring for fly tipping quite regularly. I just ring it and leave it for half an hour, and then eventually really? someone picks up, or, or it gets cut off. And that's what my residents tell me as well that you know getting through to the call center and most of the casework i get that i refer on their behalf is because they've tried to call you and not been able to get through um, and the message that you have as well tells that story it says we realize that we have staff shortages and please bear with us but um, i failed to get through today to report to amateurs for example I've, I've had to give up on that one so i'll try again tomorrow um what i would like uh, as a suggestion if there was um a way that I could access your portal without having an account. That would be great. And then I don't have to be on the phone for so long. Okay. Uh, but I don't see a way to do that without having an account, or unless you can tell me otherwise. But, um, and uh, I think... Oh, the other thing to say is I've been trying to get a little project going just in my ward about managing waste collectively. Mm -hmm. And again, you've been... Claire in particular, very supportive of that. Lots of good ideas, and I know they'll be really helping me to to make a success of the uh, the temporary pop up skips that I've got um, for the ward. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Chair. Jill. Hopefully, you can um, take those points on board. I think the the wider point in terms of members' access, whether a, a access could be given to members in to, to have a more direct line, whether that be um, um, in terms of n numbers as well, direct numbers. So, okay, Councillor Lewin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm the councillor for the Arboretum Ward, where you've got a number of properties. And I'm really pleased to see that you're starting this asset strategy. Yeah. Because what I've been frustrated with, with some of my properties, is um, when residents are requesting improvements to the external areas, that it hasn't been seen as a, a priority. Um, for example, one bench for loads of people during lockdown was not ideal and the bench itself is a bit dodgy. So having a standard for your sites where you have that many people and maybe that many benches or that many this or that many that, it's almost like, you know, cycle parking. If you've got an asset strategy, that to me, that's, that's a really welcome sign. Thank you. Um, the other thing is about your EPCs, um, so that most of your homes are above a C. I know that I've got, you've got some homes in the Arboretum that are actually a D. Yeah. Um, and in fact, when we were door knocking, they didn't actually have an EPC and we reported it and you got it done for us, which was great. But when you've got a D, are you going to actively go back to those and get them to C's? Because I know that some of the residents in those homes, are they've been there a long time, they're quite elderly, and they have said to me that their bills are just too much at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> That, that's great on the asset strategy. De that's definitely what we're picking up. Um, so, ag again, kind of creating that investment plan that's specific for those for those areas. Um, on the EPC, I think we've got about 40 across Worcester that are below a C. Um, we've done, I think we've probably, um, we're in wave one of the government's DCAR fund for social housing. We've just put in a massive bid for, for wave two. Um, which would deal with all of our properties. I think in total we've got about 4,000 across all of the stock that's below a C. Um, so that's something like £70 million um, programme of investment over the next two and a half years. Um, and we've agreed to bring that forward so that it covers every single property. Um, so that will pick up the Worcester properties. I'm not entirely sure of the detail of it, but, but we can get that checked out. Um, some of them require kind of quite significant investment um, where it's kind of wall insulation. Some of them are really, really tiny, like really small things that need to be done. Um, so if, if we're successful with the government bid, great. If we're not, definitely some of those smaller scale things will get done quite quickly. And then we'll be programming in some of the, 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 bigger, the bigger sort of things that we need to do like insulation as part of the plan program anyway so yeah I, th I think we've got around about 40 but we can we can come back to you on a bit of detail on that Thanks, yeah you. i think just in terms of the contacts um we've put on on the slide um just some of the local contacts for the teams so so i think probably i know we, we do this with other local authorities is kind of give councillors a list of who's who um, and what they deal with so that's something that's dead easy for, for us to fix so rather than kind of setting up you that that account i think it's just go direct to the officers and we'll give you those contact details okay. yep and then if you don't get anything if you don't yeah no that's fine that that's kind of what what they're there for um and if things things don't happen then that's you know it's escalating it to peter and myself if if, if things aren't aren't happening on the back of the it's on the back of that, but then we can send through to yeah. Tom. We'll send you through um, a, a contact list for, for local staff as well. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. I've got Councillor Lucy Hudson and then Councillor Stephen Hudson. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that um, you list um, Lippard Kettleby. That's Swaddafield, isn't it? Do you know Take Peter? your word for, for it. Yeah, sorry, yes. I don't know, yeah. Because... Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of the councillors for the area, mm. and, and, and uh, at least one resident has um, contacted us to um, request that um, he actually wants to purchase the property okay. as a right to buy, but in, unfortunately he's completely thwarted right. um, because it's actually designated a rural um, 
a rural a designated rural area right now it isn't a rural area okay um the houses are were built about 10 years ago mm -hmm. um, and um, really at some point um, we'd like to try and um, amend it. The, the, uh, I know Duncan Rudge on the planning have, have started it but okay. I just thought I'd let you know um, that um because it's 74 houses it's one of the largest areas um and um other people might also want to um buy them look at, as well look at, look at by. i think i think lloyd might know a bit more of the detail okay yeah thank you chair um yes we we, we are aware of this particular issue as councillor hodson says um Duncan Reg from Planning is involved and, and CLT are involved. Tom has recently provided a paper on the issue. So um, potentially it's not just an issue for uh, Councillor Hodgson's ward, but other areas that are on the boundary of the city as well. So we're currently looking into that uh, and coming to a, uh, con considering it for, for future. But it is, particularly this area, it is, it is for citizens. Okay. Well, if, 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 you, if you know the detail, just give us the details and we, yeah. can, we can have a look at it. Thank you. I'm, so, I'm sorry okay. to just, but I, I wasn't sure until now which housing authority it was thank you okay uh, councillor stephen hudson okay i've got two questions for you um i represent the ward of the parish north ward of the city which includes wainwright road where you've got apex house so therefore the first one i'm going to ask because obviously i'll take interest in local employers on that particular site um what is your sort of headcount there and what sort of function do you do there in terms of, in terms of that? that? That's the first question regarding that. And the second question is um, Huxley, which is um, off um, Plantation Drive, is one of your developments in um, Warren and Parish North. And I have to say, you know, it is uh, probably one of the best social housing developments i've actually seen it's really really good and the houses are, are, are in um good condition and i think it is i think i think i think it's a good place for people to live in affordable homes and that but i know the these, these houses were built sort of in the um early noughties and um as, a, as an owner of a house in warner villages in the that sort of era i do know that um people are now replacing things like bathrooms and, and stuff like that because they're now starting to come to the end of their life. So even though they're a relatively new, new property, things do have to be replaced. So in terms of those sorts of properties, what plans have you got in terms of um, improvements to them? Can you, can you do the first one? Yeah. I can, can tell you one. about from the housing management who we've got located in, in Apex Park. So we have a, a neighbourhood team which consists of a neighbourhood team leader and three neighbourhood officers, so that's four. Then we have um, four um, income officers, again, with a team leader. And then we have uh, our employment coach, because we're part of the Fusion Partnership, so we have three um, uh, employment coaches that are based outside, uh, based from um, Apex Park. And then we have two allocation um, colleagues who work there, so I'm just trying to busy adding what that, <laughs> all those numbers are up. So there's, um, so that's um, five, four, nine, isn't that, that's um, around about 12 staff. Now also from that office um, is our direct labor force, our direct repairs teams are all based from that service, from that building. So we'd have to come back with you with those details because I don't know how many um, operate outside of that, um, that office, but we can provide those, how many um, trades operatives and um admin support staff to the, the repairs team yeah we'll we'll, we'll confer, confirm that we've got i think it's two floors on that building isn't it yeah. um pro probably the, the the biggest team in there is probably the repairs team and the estate services team but, but we'll come back to you on that um in terms of the the specific development and again kind of back to the asset strategy um 
that in in our current asset strategy and it'll we'll we'll, we'll do we'll probably be doing the same um is we'll have that kind of um life cycle component replacement so we'll say i don't know a kitchen needs replacing every 30 years a bathroom every 20. um but that that will also be based on condition as well so it's not necessarily waiting for it to get that old if if the condition requires it to be replaced then it would get replaced um again kind of back to um the review of the asset strategy and making sure that um we've got those local plans that are specific to those areas um what what we tend to do and we'll probably do more of um, a regular stock condition survey so that we'll be picking those things up um, so generally it, it's based on age renewal but if we're picking things up either through a survey or it comes through as a repair um, we and it needs actually whole replacement it should get replaced got one point back on that um... I understand why you do that. Somebody who, for example, takes care of their property could in theory have ended with older bathroom suites, older kitchens and that, and therefore they're therefore in a way they're being penalized long term for actually being careful and looking after their um their um their property. So um, you know, will property be eventually have be have things renewed? Um, because obviously there does come to a time where something becomes dated and uh, even though it might still be perfectly serviceable. Yeah, and, and, and I suppose what I should have said around con condition, um, that, that's not necessarily, it's kind of falling to pieces, but that could be that it's, it's, it's not kind of of modern standard. Um, so so that, that kind of would come under that, that condition um, badge, I suppose. So, um, I don't know, if it's really, really old kitchen and it's not kind of got those modern facilities, then yes, it would get replaced. I don't I don't know the specifics of that area, but we can have a little look at the um, when we last did the stock condition survey then and when things are due, we can have a look at that. Come back to you. Okay. And I've got Councillor Mackay. Yep, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Um, it's interesting to see about um, you, on your chart about uh, we will have impact and I appreciate what you're saying that you're looking at this from March in particular but I'm just wondering you use the um, the bidding system for um, people who want want to premises I just wondered if you've had any contact with partners um, like Worcestershire Children's First um, within the County Council um, particularly for looked after children, children who are in the um, care of the local authority who might be transitioning from care into independent living and such like um, and um, sort of keeping them updated about what housing stock you have perhaps or what might be available or if they could come to you, uh, you know, maybe a little bit, not necessarily short notice because most of it is planned out but it's, um, it's just a thought for, as I say, children who have been in foster care or residential care transitioning into looking at living independently. You can um, have one, Peter. Yeah, we can, we can certainly um, speak to the, re if you can introduce us to the relevant partners. We have a project called the House Project, which we operate with the Coventry City Council, where we, um, they work um, in conjunction with a provider to, to make, to help care leavers get ready um, for independent living. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a model. It's do. a model. And so we provide the accommodation, but it is um, a, an established charity organization that is actually actively working with young people um you know so it does provide lots of hands-on support about getting ready um and then obviously as as they they do a lot of preparation work um when people are transitioning into independence and so they work with them right from the beginning and then obviously those people that are ready they then move into we've got them um, 10 properties working with them at the moment where we've got 10 young people who have come out of the care system who have um, had support, had, had you know, made sure they've got the right skills and they will be supported through that, uh, that process. And it's also about, about peer support as well. So we'd definitely be interested in um, developing something similar um, if there was um, the capacity within the County Council to do that. Yeah. Thank you. I'll have the final two speakers, Councillor De Serra and Councillor Owen Fury. I've got a specific question. Private roads. What do you do with your private roads in terms of 
Pardon? Never the not to be in the list. There's, there's no yes. highways. Yes, and no prospect of that either. Um, they, they will, they're all part of our asset management strategy, but as, you, as um, in the past, we have done them. We, are you talk, talking about gamekeepers? No. no go, go. Totally. We did a, a, a piece of work there a couple of years ago where, again, it was an adopted road, and um, we actually replaced or, um, and put it to the, the correct standards. Um, mm -hmm. So what we will do is we'll look at um, whether we can do that, who's the responsibility and what the longer-term maintenance is. Is it worth us? actually starting again or actually um, do we just um, repair as we go but obviously that it's about making the decisions on um, what your priorities are in your investment strategy what would be the next step so i've been through the local team and got a stonewall basically on, on this particular matter so what do i send the information to you well we'll have to have a look at it and consider yeah. it and so see what we can so see the local team do. have looked at it yeah, so, so well, if you if you send it through either to Peter or myself, and we can have a look. Which which road was it again? Coberly Close. Coberly Close. Okay. And and again, I think I think that's part of that asset management strategy review again, um, because I think a, a lot of the focus over the years has been on on that kind of on the internals, not necessarily yeah. on the externals. Yeah. And as Peter said, we know from our kind of customer feedback that that's really important mm -hmm. um, and um, it's kind of important to us as well because it's about the kind of look and feel of the place I think you mentioned the garage sites as yes, well yes. Um, so it, it's about having that plan for all of the garage sites so that we're not just doing just yeah. one and then leaving a few others no no because they're, you know, they're all they're all not in fit need. for purpose anymore exactly, it, exactly. Um, so it's a that that's really what that review is on on the asset strategy is to be really clear what we need to do kind of total need of investment um looking at how we do that again that kind of balance between investing in the existing and and also providing new homes um so yeah more more than happy to have a look at that thank you thank you very much and, and just one more quick question uh, maintenance charges how you break them down and define them that's another query that that comes up quite a bit um, sort of, uh, I don't know if that's a possibility. Would that fit for, for like service charges? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, that's helpful. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Cleary. Thanks, Chair. Um, it's a simple question, and I've just got a simple answer. Um, on the slide where we talk about the homes, where they are in the city, I know where all these places are, but I don't. What does NA mean? That's that. That's, that's not. A, I'm not. I'm not, not being applied. Applied. I'm no, not you caught us out. You caught us out. Peter noticed that today. Um, <laughs> our, our business intelligence team provided that, that information, and, and that slide <laughs> went in. Um, we have got. They have actually given us a revised slide, and I did say to your colleague here because um, he raised it with me that we can circulate the right slide, and it yes. is split down by wards. Yeah, so, yeah, there they are, are real places. places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Damn, so, we thought we got away well, with that then. Really pleased yeah. that you read the presentation. So yeah. Yeah, ten, ten well, points. yeah, we'll make sure that goes that goes across to Tom and uh, we can send that out as an update. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think we've had a really um, decent discussion um, on, on your presentation. I have got a couple of questions before I sum up and thank you for your uh, time. Um, number one, it's obviously a hot topic at the moment in terms of damp and mould. And obviously, the unfortunate tragic case of Iwabi Shaf up in Rochdale. In terms of response times for um, for citizen housing in making um, mould and damper priorities, is there a, um, a, a an emergency protocol in place to deal with those issues? Yeah. Um, so um, we 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 always had um, a dedicated team within repairs and maintenance, but. I think what what used to happen um, was that they would just go through the repairs process so they just get reported as a repair um, if it was um, a kind of a minor issue that would then get dealt with and then only when it was reported a second time would it get looked at by a specialist team that's all changed um, so we have um, a dedicated team so if if a if somebody can get through and they're not waiting half an hour, um, then um, that goes directly through to the damper, damper mould team. Then they send out a surveyor. Um, the, it, there's either a kind of a short term solution, because um, sometimes it is about heating and, and ventilation. Um, so there might be a short term solution that, that is the wash down, um, or there might be a longer term solution required, which might be fitting ventilation that's not there. 
Um, it might be external wall insulation, it might be improved heating. Um, so what happens with those is that they go into a programme that then get delivered as part of a programme of, uh, program of improvements. I think perhaps what we weren't doing before and we do now is to go back and check as well. So I think we were always relying on the customer coming back to us to say it hasn't worked. Um, so, so we now have a kind of active programme of going back in and checking it. I think for, for Worcester, in, in total, we've got across all of our stock about 2,400 cases which were from April last year to um, December or January, January this year. Um, most of those have either been dealt with, booked in, or they're kind of out, out with a surveyor. In Worcester, we've had, no, Worcestershire. Worcestershire. Um, we've got around about 70 cases. Um, and again, I don't know the detail, but I would imagine that most of those have, have probably been dealt with by now. Um, so it's more of an issue in some of our kind of non-traditional stock. Um, so, you know, some of the kind of wimpy no finds that we've got in, in Coventry, less of an issue here, but that's not to say that we, we, we don't treat that seriously. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it'd be really useful to have that update if those 70 okay. cases have been, you know, yep. have been, have been dealt with. Um, finally, I mean, one point I think uh, Councillor Clear, um, Councillor Hodson picked up on regarding your offices. They seem quite outlying for some um, a lot of your customer base. Was that a strategic decision in terms of accessibility for your customers or convenience for your employees? Um, I think it's 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 more us moving to a different a different way of working, um, and that's about um, seeing customers in the homes. Um, rather than having an office open that, to be honest, I think the footfall and certainly from my experience, you don't really get that many people coming in um, to a local office anyway. Um, there is a big piece of work that we need to do um, and um, that's dealing with all of the kind of the customer contact centre and kind of getting through there quickly. Peter mentioned about doing more of the kind of online services that lots of people are used to doing. Um, so so that's, that's the strategy. It's not for our convenience. Um, it is more about kind of making it convenient for the customer. So if we need to see somebody, we see them in the home or we provide it really easy to get in contact with us and have a conversation. If they do need to have um, have a kind of a face to face and they don't want it in the home, then we'll provide um, access to the to the office to do that. Okay, I've, I've got a number of questions. I won't ask them. One final question. Okay, is regarding boilers and hot water. Is, mm -hmm. Without, if hot, if a boiler goes down and you don't, don't have hot water, is that classed as an emergency? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, can I say, uh, really appreciate your time here this evening. I've um, been really impressed by your the, the approach that you've taken in terms of customer focus and uh, around your citizens, as you've called them, in terms of building your strategy around there. Obviously, cases have been highlighted where yeah. there are ongoing issues, but whether it's a combination of factors in terms of um, how well do you do that customer um, service element and the fact that you've got reduced stock here, um, does bode well going forward in terms of how, how you are responding to the to, to, to the needs of, of the residents. So really appreciate your time. Welcome uh, any feedback from yourself as well regarding tonight's meeting and obviously we'll provide um, some feedback for you in terms of that. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. brilliant. Thanks very much. Take care. Can we just uh, ask the committee to formally note that report then, please? Noted. Thank you. Okay, can we go on to agenda item six then, please? Setting of the budget for 23-24. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Uh, we have met that, uh, we've reached that part of the cycle when we uh, try to finalise our budget for this year and look through any revisions to the uh, proposals we looked at back in November and collect any thoughts that you may have on, on changes that you want to see implemented for the coming year. Uh, the budgets for this committee set out in Appendix 1. As you can see, the, uh, there is a, a growth in the budget from 2.168 for 22-23 through to 3.047 million for 
23-24. That is partly to do with employees' costs increasing. The top line there, we're, we're planning, we're anticipating an increase of 5% for the coming year on top of the 7.5% which were paid in 22-23. But the other significant growth there you'll see is under third party payments, uh, budget which is growing by approximately 600,000. That is in relation to an item which is elsewhere on the agenda this evening in, in respect to freedom leisure is the primary part of that. So we'll discuss that in more detail later on. Uh, the capital programme in Appendix 2 reflects the various projects which are underway at the moment, uh, some of which fall to the to the interest of this committee through things like the Townsville projects and uh, or extra work that we're doing around uh, property and so on. And then a third appendix, which we've been adding in this year, tries to reflect the overall position so that members are aware of where we are as the council as a whole and to bear that context in mind when thinking about any changes that uh, want to be introduced this evening to the budgets going forward. We have uh, a position which we reflected back in December of 13.7 million as our overall budget. There have been a few changes since then, mounting to not a great deal of difference, but we have had our government grants, which has brought in around about 1.1 million, which is what we were expecting, so that was, that was fine. So things are as, as anticipated. But the net impact of those changes means that we have a forecast budget gap of 1.8 million. Now, there are changes that are taking place at the moment, so that will rise a little to 1.9 million, but again, in the light of, of uh, discussions this evening, may fall further if we accept all the proposals which are in there. Nonetheless, there is a significant budget gap, and we'll be trying to meet that partly by contributions from external funding including house homelessness support funding which we will channel as much as possible into providing our homelessness uh, uh, services for this year and also finally a, a set of uh, challenges to our existing reserves to see what we can free up and release to be able to close that budget gap one way or another we'll have a remaining gap on the budget which we will then fund from our risk reserves but i have to say that will leave us in a position where we have less risk reserves than we've agreed we should have at previous committees so i'll be advising policy and resources committee about that when we get there on the 7th of february in the meantime if there are any questions or any suggestions for additions in the budget which we haven't heard to date then i'm happy to uh, to take those on board now thank you Okay, can open to questions of Councillor Lucy Hodgson. Um, just um, the museum service. Yeah. Um, on um, at, at a council at a, a at a council meeting a while ago, it was decided that the museum service is is should go to PED. So and uh, we discussed it on Monday night. So um, the. Uh, um, any any budget for the museum service to uh, must be um, deleted from here and go to PED. Yeah, through you, Chair. Yes, we agreed that on Monday night. Uh, that's an oversight on my part. We'll make sure that when the when the budget books are published, that'll be in the right committee. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions regarding the budget? To Louis. Thank you, Chair. This is just a, a, a clarification. Obviously, I'm not on this committee normally. So I just see the expenditure for the Community Safety Partnership. It looks like it's going down a lot. Is that right? For the base budget for 23 to what we had in 21, 22. So, and what is that? What, what, what's the impact of that? Thank you. Yeah, through you, Chair. So, uh, final actuals in 2021 were 163. Yes, is that the line you're looking at, Karen? Yeah. And then went down to 22, 23, 156. So, there would have been some in year adjustments, uh, basically reflecting changes as we've gone through. As you can see, the income has gone down match with the expenditure going down. So that will be a question of grants coming through and then being being um, passed across, okay? So for this year, coming back, it's going back up to 171. So it will be above what it was two years ago. Yeah. Okay, it just reflects movements in the year in terms of grants in and out. 
Okay, so it's just so the expenditure, even though it looks lower, like it was four one four, and then it goes one six five one eight one. Yeah. Yeah, it's because the, the the partnership has income coming in from out from external sources, and then that's reflected in the expenditure which takes place. So if those grants aren't there, then the expenditure isn't there. So it's it's just matching the the income and expenditure go down. Uh, not as far as I'm aware of. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the question you're asking is whether there's been a decrease in service as a result of it. I'm just sort of liaised with Warwick, and what Warwick thinks is probably something to do with um, the lag in uh, PCC grants coming through. Um, and we also hosted the Knife Angel, to which there was a cost. Um, but we, we can absolutely assure you that there's been no, no cut, and there are intended to be no cuts in respect to community safety resource. Thank you. Any other questions on the budget? No. I mean, I think it's just fair to say, um, to kind of state the bleeding obvious in, in that we're, we're, there's some tough choices to be made. I mean, we, we haven't, as a committee, brought forward any proposals. We're trying to be as prudent as possible, I hope, in terms of trying to see the overall picture over the next couple of years. Not to say that there won't be, you know, any, any coming forward, but I think it just reflects the um, the hard work that Shane and his and Mark have put in in terms of trying to get a, a budget that so that we can pass. Obviously, there's still a deficit that needs to be dealt with, and go, dipping into our risk reserve. So, so there's going to be some tough choices uh, coming ahead, and, and, I, I, and I urge all, all party m members to obviously bear that in mind when bringing forward any proposals going forward. And okay, the recommendations. Can we take them on block? Is that okay, Julian? Yeah. Yeah. All right. 1.1 to 1.4 then, be happy to agree those. Thank you, that's agreed. Agenda item seven, review of funding arrangements for Worcester Play Council. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, just to start off with um, a little bit of, of background information. Um, Worcester Play Council was um, set up back in 1987 as a local registered charity and it was actually set up by the City Council um, and it has a board of trustees and a constitution and a current stated vision that every child has access to play in Worcester. The Play Council aims to deliver play activities at outdoor locations across the city um, but as they own no tangible assets of their own. They subcontract the play service to Purdeswell Young People's Leisure Club. And they've delivered the Fun Squad programme across the city for the last five years. Um, and this arrangement currently continues on a rolling year by year basis, subject to the allocation of a grant from the City Council. In terms of um, more recent history, from a, from a financial point of view, um, funding of 40,000 was allocated from the new homes bonus for the period from 2016 to 2019. Um, and then in 2020, the council provided an additional grant of 3,750. And more recently, there was an allocation of 15,000 um, in February of 2022 to enable the play council to employ a, part, um, a play coordinator to lead and support create an appropriate play opportunities. Um, in terms of the Fun Squad programme that they produce, it took place back in July and August. So the primary programme takes place during the, the main summer holiday period. And, and they, do, they do all the bits and pieces through the rest of the year, but the main focus is on the summer. Um, in July and August, about 400 local children took part in play sport and craft activities at 12 venues across the city, um, with the most popular destinations being Gallivault Park, the Guild Hall, Nippard Hub, Cripplegate Park, and of course, Worcester Community Trust hubs as well. However, when undertaking the due diligence on this review, um, we did find that there were discrepancies in the performance information that was being provided. Um, and that related to things like performance indicators. So when we started to look for evidence on the numbers in attendance at some of the programmes, there were just some discrepancies in reporting. Um, 
there were some issues around the updating of the information on the website. So the Play Council website at the moment um, hasn't been updated probably for about the last three years. Um, and from a social media point of view, uh, there was some claims made in the performance indicators that quite a lot of work had been done via social media channels. But when we actually started to look into the details of all that, we found that that actually wasn't the case. So as a result of that, um, myself and Rosina Shearer, um, who, who kind of oh, we did the, the, the review in conjunction with, um, we met with Phil Weston, um, who's the trustee and treasurer of, of Worcester Play Council, and also um, Hayley Talley, who's the play coordinator. Um, and both Phil and Hayley um, are members of the management team at Purdiswell Young People's Club. So obviously, you know, it's hosted there. They, they hold all the information in terms of the background details. So we talked through all of that detail. Um, and what I've just touched on there was some of the outcomes of that information, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, and then we met with Heather who Heather Gianese, who is the chair of Worcester Play Council, um, the following week back in October. Just to clarify really the role of the Play Council historically, and that is to, it's three things really. First of all, to deliver a programme of play across the city, which as I've touched on, they currently subcontract to Purdiswell Young People's Club. The second part is to allocate grants to local groups for them to use for their own play activities but that's not pre presently taking place because of a lack of external funding coming in. Um, and the third element is to apply for external funding via applications from the board members. Um, and again, there is limited resource to do that and therefore there's minimal activity taking place. So as a result of that, the primary funding source for the Play Council comes from the City Council with only a small limited amount of money coming in from, from other sources. Um, as a result of, of, of some of this work, uh, Worcester City Council has also established a, a youth collaborative forum back in, in the summer of last year. Um, and it's made up of representatives from Worcester Community Trust, Purdiswell Young People's Club, Freedom Leisure, Young Solutions, Lippard Hub and Action for Children. And the, the principle really is that it's a networking group that meets on a bi-monthly basis um, to establish and share information um, and also to identify potential joint funding bids in order to try and generate additional funds for play activities in the city. Um, and one of those opportunities coming up next year will be the uh, recommissioning of the Young Positive Activities Fund through the County Council, which has a pot of about 80,000. Um, one of the other outcomes that we identified is that from a contractual point of view, Freedom Leisure are required to provide up to 104 hours of free use of the indoor sports facility at Purdiswell Leisure Centre. Um, and in tracking back historically, we found that um, that hasn't been the case in recent years. So that ability to use that indoor space hasn't been, hasn't been captured and taken advantage of. Um, and that, again, I think is primarily to do with kind of relationships. Um, so, in order to continue the service, um, the recommendation is that we, we provide a further 15,000 during 23-24 to allow the following actions to be completed and to give us more clarity. First of all, I hope everybody around the table is already fully aware of the Harper Perry play consultation taking place in the city at the moment. A lot of nodding heads, so that's, that's a positive. Um, so yeah, first of all, it would allow the play consultation to take place um, and that will determine for us um, exactly what current provision is, what, what the suggested um, provision looks like in the future and to get a better understanding really of, of what constitutes play in the eyes of both young children from the age of 1 to 11 and also young people from 12 to 18. 
It'll also give us the opportunity to have a look at the findings from a, a research study that was undertaken by um, the university. One of the board members on the play council um, is based at the university and has just completed um, a piece of research work there that, that will allow us to look at that information and, and, and use more effectively. Um, it will allow the play council to work with council officers to build a sustainable an effective relationship with Freedom Leisure moving forward, um, not only to take advantage of those 104 hours that are available, but but also to develop that relationship in terms of um, a win-win situation in, in, in promoting services and that as well. Um, it'll allow us to decide whether the Youth Collaborative Forum has proved a successful model in obtaining additional funding sources. Um, and it will also give us the opportunity to take a look at what the play council have been able to achieve from a from a social media point of view so using their their platforms of, of facebook instagram and twitter um, how well they've promoted the play activities around the city um, one of the things that you'll find when you look on the website is is a kind of distinct lack of um promotion of, of previous events that have taken place so every year as an example um the play council through perdiswell young people's club host a uh, a play day um which the, the numbers reported tell, tell us was very successful um but unfortunately there doesn't seem to have been any um attempt to take advantage of the situation in terms of promoting that event so for instance there's a lack of um, photographic evidence of the events that took place. Um, and there's also a lack of information gathered from those individuals. So understanding who it is that attended last summer, ideally, we would want to be in a position where they created a database of contacts to be able to promote future events and, and programs to. And that isn't the case at the moment. Um, and also, one of the primary aims really of the play council when it was established was to particularly attract children from those hard to reach areas and being able to use that information on a database to be able to do some postcode mapping and understand exactly where those children are traveling to to the events would put us in a, in a far better position in terms of knowing whether we're actually attracting the audience the main audience that we're trying to um, and finally it just gives us the opportunity to review the accuracy of the performance data that's provided during that period as well so the preferred option at this stage is to maintain the status quo and to continue to deliver the service via the play council with ongoing financial support of 15k in this financial year um, but there will be further support provided via quarterly performance meetings with the council's lead projects and voluntary sector officer who is responsible for, for overseeing the grant to ensure that the agreed performance measures are in place and delivering effective outcomes. Um, so to kind of sum up the, the recommendation is that the approval goes through for the 15,000 um, community grant and that a further report will be presented to the committee during this financial year to present options of how the council wishes to enable the provision of play um, and activities to be funded for 24, 25 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, before I open it up to the floor, um, I mean, I think it's important to just digest what some of the information Alan has well all of the information Alan has told us that actually it doesn't really make any good good reading and all good listening in terms of where the play council has found itself um the position it's found itself in and some of the, <clears throat> the claims that they're making and it'll be interesting to hear some of the members questions in, ter in terms of that I think it's probably just as important to realize that actually the wrong move now to, would be to do something drastic and cut that um, opportunity for for play off but however there are some real pressing concerns which i hope the committee can 
um, can bring out in terms of their their concerns and a, a way forward in terms of dealing with those. Councillor Lucy Hobson. First of all, um, I'd, I'd like to declare an interest. Both Stephen and myself are trustees of the Lepard Hub. Um, I hadn't realised that uh, it was um, quite sig significant. Um, I just like to say that I went to the event in um, um, Govelt Park last year with the with Stephen being the mayor, and actually it was really well attended. Um, and I certainly have uh, um, sponsored um, and used funds for Ferdis World Young People's Centre to particularly um, the um, fun days in the Guildhall and that sort of thing. So I personally have actually seen that it was well attended and it was actually um, worthwhile. Thanks, Councillor Hodgson. I believe Lloyd wanted to come in. Yeah, Chair, I just wanted to clarify the um, uh, the funding position for this. Alan did did um, uh, cover it um, um, briefly. Um, so, uh, as Shane pointed out in his budget report, we we don't have any new money uh, uh, for, for for anything this year. And so the uh, the proposal is that the the, the fifteen thousand pound is taken from the um, the community grants fund uh, to, to to pay for this. So so that's the the pot of money um, where. This year, I think the maximum uh, amount of grant we give is two or three thousand pounds, five thousand pounds uh, per grant, and we've got a number of members who sit on that panel. Um, so just to be clear on that one, this isn't this isn't new money. This is this is this is money that we we would need to repurpose from from that community grants fund. But that is in that that is within the gift of this community. Uh, this, this Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cleary. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, it's a quick question regarding points 3.5 and 3.6, um, where the officer said um, regarding the, the play council's primary function um, to apply for external funding for applications submitted by board members, minimal activity currently being undertaken due to limited resources, which has led to the council being the main um, provider. Um, is there an, any indication or a plan of when normal services are going to reserve, resume so that they're not on minimal um, activity anymore? Thank you, Chair. I mean, that, that, that's why really we've been looking at alternative ways of being able to provide more resource and again through the, the, the kind of um, the youth forum there that will hopefully bring more um, more time and expertise to the table and what we need to create is more of a collaborative approach um, I think previously there's probably been too much work in silos um, so the the ability through that kind of collaborative youth forum um, to bring those kind of partners around the city together um, and to identify ways in which they can not only bid for money individually but also collectively I think will be a step in the right direction, both in terms of, of expertise and time. So that would be what we would intend to see within the next 12 months while we now take the next step of trying to provide appropriate support to get us with the Play Council and put us our Young People's Club to where we want to be in terms of future provision. Is that answer your question, Councillor Cleary? Yes. Okay. Councillor De Sarah. Um, I need to clarify something. I, I sit to, uh, for the council as an out, for the play council as an outside body. Should I have declared that and left the room or anything like that? No. Okay. Thank you for that. But you should have declared it because I'm declared. I'm, I'm I know. I, I didn't realise. Apologies. Yes, yes, but you can declare it now. I am declaring it now. Yes. I don't, I don't think it's ever come to a committee before the play council, so victim of me being a newbie. So apologies. Thank you. Fine. Julian, can we record that? Just to note that. 
Are there any other questions? Councillor Lam? Can I, can I go back and clarify this point under 3.2 about these discrepancies? And then it, it says, um, you know, discrepancies in the performance information. Please refer to Appendix 1 for further details. So the list of activities that are on page 29, is that a verified list of what actually happened? Because what seems to be being suggested in 3.2, and correct me if I'm misunderstanding this, is that there are activities that were claimed to have happened which didn't happen. Because, you know, three, on page 29, we've got this list of activities. But then there's another two pages of, of blank tables. Now, I appreciate that on page 33, it's talking about quarter four, which clearly hasn't happened yet. But quarter three, um, October, November, December, is it? Because we haven't got the data yet for that. Um, but but is, that, is that verified data then on page 29? These activities quoted here are verified activities that have actually taken place. Is, is that is that correct? They're, they're verified activities. The, the discrepancies came in the reporting process because what we were finding was that from various sources we were getting discrepancies with the numbers in attendance. Right. So it wasn't so much verifying the actual events taking place, it was the numbers in attendance. So sorry, when, when, are, we, when are we likely to get the data then for uh, October, November, December then? Sorry, the reason, the reason that that information um, hasn't been attached is that the primary programme is delivered within the quarter two summer period. So the, the work that would have done been, been done outside of that is just at this kind of shorter half term period. Um, so the primary focus was just on that six week summer holiday period. You happy with that, Councillor Lamb? Uh, Councillor De Sarah. Thank you. Um, so when I attended my first meeting there, whenever it was, June or something, uh, as, as a, an outside person, um, I was struck by the fact that they didn't cater for anybody over the age of 12, which did seem a big hole. So, and I don't know what the plan is to fill that gap because I still don't see anything doing that. So I think that's something I just like noted. But the events that I have experienced and seen, especially the, the, the summer fun day, the spectacular day. I mean, I think there are strengths and weaknesses within this little organization. Um, and when you compare their play ranges and the way that they interact with children and the people from uh, PERD as well, um, or, or from Freedom Leisure, there is quite a difference the freedom and leisure people tend to stand back and wait for anybody to wander up to them. It probably doesn't happen. Whereas they are much more engaged with, with the local, with the people, the, the children who turn up. So I think they do have some strengths, is all I really wanted to say. Um, but that, that is the gap for the older children. It is, it's not just a responsibility of Worcester Play Council, but it would have been you know, a nice thing to see. And I did ask, have asked if they could do a survey on that in a similar way as they've done for the younger ones. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that there is an awful lot of good work taking place here. Um, and I think there is, there is something to build on there. Um, I think it was just a case that the, the, the review did identify quite a number of areas, really, where as a, as a model for delivering play, you would want to make um, fairly significant improvements. Um, the piece of work that was undertaken by, by the board member based at the university, as you say, did kind of focus on the younger age group, but there's absolutely no reason why that piece of work can't be replicated now and, and delivered with that kind of, um, kind of 12 to 18 age group um, in conjunction with their findings from the, from the play strategy as well. Thank you. I'll uh, sum up if that's okay then. Oh, Thank you very much for your uh, report. Um, yeah, I mean, just just want to highlight the importance, um, firstly, of, of play um, for, for children, and, and particularly the stated objective of targeting, you know, deprived areas. You know, um, I, th I think that's you know absolutely vital, and you know, I think it's right for the council to put resources into that. 
um, I'm pleased to hear that kind of activities that have occurred, um, you know, have, have been positive. Although, um, I guess one of the things in the report is that we just don't know whether they effectively targeted, uh, you know, deprived areas, um, uh, you know, or not. Um, you, you report, um, I found it quite sobering, um, you know, to, to be, you know, the thread through it was um, concern about the governance arrangements of Worcester, Worcester Play Council and, and whether that their governance arrangements are, are effective um, at ensuring that, you know, they are sort of moving forward and delivering what they've said that they will deliver, um, you know, which is what we want for the children, uh, you know, of Worcester City. Um, I, I suppose the question is, well, what I don't see in your recommendations um, is anything um, related to, you know, changes to the government arrangements um, of Worcester Play Council that might, uh, you know, improve the situation going forward. There's obviously the, the, the proposal that there's more close monitoring, more work for Worcester City Council officers to keep tabs on them, but surely that's something that the Play Council itself should be doing internally um, and providing reports to the council rather than council officers having to uh, chase this this sort of information up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you know historically, I can't kind of comment on on what's gone before. You know, we can only kind of comment on the findings through through the recent um, review. Um, but you're absolutely right in terms of the way we move forward now it will need for us to spend some time getting around the table with the play council, with the board members, determining what their future direction looks like and how that will be delivered. And from the council's point of view, whether that still remains the most appropriate vehicle for the provision of the play service moving forward, or whether there's an alternative method um, for successful delivery of play in the city. Um, but at this point in time, um, there's obviously quite, it's quite a, a, a tough environment. Um, some providers are focusing more on consolidation at this time. Freedom Leisure is, a, as an example, as a leisure operator. Um, you know, in the financial climate at the moment, they are looking to consolidate their existing services rather than expand the service. Um, so, you know, it is a case of us really kind of getting around the table with, with, all the, with all the organizations and the partners that can bring us something to the table really and, and create a model that will successfully deliver play for the city in the future, which involves us knowing who's attending, where they come from in the city, what the value of that play service looks like, how that play provision kind of, um, operates in conjunction with the sporting activities we provide through our leisure operator and that to, to provide that whole kind of holistic approach really um, to children whether they like sporting activities or whether whether they like like more play and craft based activities one of the points in the in the report is um, that yeah, the play council doesn't have any assets them, them, themselves um, so a number of the activities have been delivered, delivered through um, the um, Worcester Community Trust um, facilities and uh, outdoor you know, play spaces um, so I don't know it, uh, you, you mentioned in the alternative option that, the, that these would be delivered by Worcester Community Trust which does seem like a, a, the obvious partner to provide funding to to provide play services um, however you've sort of mitigated that by say or, or, or downplayed that by saying that you think that, that will reduce you know the, the provision of play um, I'm wondering why why you think that that's the case given that these these were en were anyway provided through the parks and um, and the Worcester Community Trust facilities anyway no, that, that, pure, that comment was based on um, the fact that the funding that exists at the moment would be withdrawn. So, for instance, if there wasn't approval for that 15,000 in this financial year, that the whatever remains of the play service would ultimately end up having to be delivered through people like Worcester Community Trust and Freedom Leisure, but obviously without any additional funding on top of the 
the stresses and strains that they're already under, that would inevitably probably lead to a, a decline in the service because of the lack of that extra funding. Mm. What was consideration given to that funding being reallocated to Worcester Community Trust or, or an alternative partner? That is part of the review moving forward. Right. Yeah. So in the next twelve in the next twelve months, that right. is the, we'll, we'll be looking at various avenues that we can take the service in the future. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Just, just final comment. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's a really important review, and, and, and you know, ho hopefully that this is sort of the starting point, really, for ensuring that you know that Worcester City Council's resources are used effectively, and you know that the play uh, facilities and opportunities are, are expanded specifically to deprived areas. Thank you, Councillor Lewing. The final. Thank you, Chair. Um, in lieu of what you've been saying uh, in answer to the people's questions, um, you know the strategic plan that's been provided, um, it mentions um, they're going to provide activities for people between age 12 and 16. Um, and also the aims that they've got in there, they're not smart targets, they're not measurable. Can this be revisited, please, with, in mind with all the, the points that people have been made, made here today? and a more comprehensive plan that actually is strategic be submitted to the committee. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, well, I mean, Councillor Steve Cochran kind of summed up what I was going to say in terms of how everybody's perception around the table ha has been in terms of are the play council targeting the right people that they're supposed to be targeting from, from those different groups. Um, and also what kind of play is in the general scheme. We always think of play in terms of physical activity. There are other aspects of play, and whether the the, um, the other options that we consider will fully take into, into account that. And the, the, um, the going forward in terms of the review, as I said at the start of this meeting, nothing's off the table now. We have, we're in a new world. We're looking at new ways of, fulfilling our obligations out to there and there are new models of working we're pushing an abcd model which is a community-based model where does that fit into all, all of the picture lucy i'm not taking any more questions can i, can I just say that it was i'm prepared to take this forward and the play we sh we're doing actually the play consultation and all of this will will feed into yeah will feed into it anyway that was all fine thank you yeah and in because terms... because we we actually took a run from communities because of the um the level of the business on this on this committee okay, okay. that was about a year but ago we won't have anything left will I, so... that, that was about a year ago <laughs> No problem. Yeah, okay. Appreciate it. Yeah, and, and that, I mean, to sum up, that play review and the HarperCollins is really important that if you haven't fed into HarperCollins' um, view, that you do that in terms of wh where we see going forward. Um, I think it's, it's a stark reminder of obviously lack of, I mean, lack of scrutiny isn't probably the right word, but when something has been going for a long time and we don't really pay attention to it, it just, it, it uh, you know it goes under the radar and all of a sudden it surfaces in in some of these things that we we've come out in the report so um yeah definitely we need a, a new way of working and finding out where the flay council fits in the overall strategy going forward can i take the recommendations if we're all happy on block 1.1 1 1.2 1 and 1.3 please all those agreed agreed thank you Um, item, agenda item number eight, Worcester Community Trust. Thank you, John, for being so patient. My pleasure. Warwick, so, do you want to introduce this item? Yep. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I have met, no. Oh. Warwick, before you. He's so... <laughs> <laughs> First time in the hot seat, so he's... Uh... Hold him back, hold him back. So, sorry, John, just an um, order of business in the way of the introductory report. So, um, uh, same position as, um, as Tom earlier. 
in the fact that we don't really want to steal any thunder from the, the presentation itself. So um, you've got the report to refer to, um, uh, and hopefully that will guide um, your ears to, to what John's got to say in, the, in his presentation. Um, but uh, to, to note, this is um, John bringing to you an annual update for Worcester Communities Trust, um, focusing on uh, delivery against year one of the strategic, strategic plan uh, and presenting on a, a potential business plan that's yet to be approved by the, the board. Um, maybe a bit of update on that from yesterday. Um, and it's an opportunity to review the financial statements um, of, of Worcester Community Trust. Um, and there will be a matter of business after the uh, presentation just to um, uh, approve the continuation of um, uh, grant arrangements with Worcester Community Trust. So that quick summary over, over to John, <laughs> John Neary. Thank you. Uh, hopefully I'll bring some thunder. Um, so I've met most of you, to those I haven't. Uh, my name's John Newey. I'm the CEO of Worcester Community Trust. Um, you all have a longer relationship with the trust than I. Um, I've only been there seven months and many of you have known it for years. But for those who don't know it as well, um, Worcester Community Trust. Um, Worcester Community Trust celebrates all things community. We are a citywide service that operates out of six community hubs, predominantly based in historic council estates that are home to vibrant communities with strong identities. We run multiple services ranging from supporting people experiencing domestic abuse. We are confidence builders and help re-empower. We reduce loneliness and isolation. We increase people's health and build their skills. We open up new economic opportunities and we support the development of the young people of the city. Above all, we bring people together. We are a team of over 70 people with the majority being Worcester City residents. If we can bring the presentation up, please. Great, thank you. So you shall have access to the annual accounts. All that detail will be in there. Um, so this is last year. We finished uh, with a surplus of 170,000. Um, in unrestricted, we've got a reserve of about four months running costs. And really, I'm just going to explore who we reach, because um, I think that's probably more, of more interest to, to you all. Um, we reach more uh, me, uh, women than men. Um, we're currently rebalancing this through an extension of our uh, re-empowerment project, which for women is called JOY. Um, we're increasing our staff training of male-specific mental health support. And next year, we'll be increasing male targeted activity through our Community Connectors program. I want to give a little bit of context to some of these. So when we look at diagnosed disability or learning difficulty, um, scope state that 22% of the UK population are diagnosed with a disability. MENCAP state that 2% of the UK are people with learning disabilities. So when you look at who we reach, we're reaching people with highly complex issues and we reach an over-representation of those people in, re in reference to the UK and also to Worcester City. Um, again, with the mental uh, health condition, 20, uh, NHS say 25% of people are diagnosed with a mental health condition, we reach 40%. So when we think about our services as being quite light and fluffy, in actual fact, <laughs> we, we deal with some really complex things. Again, with the age breakdown, to um, we reach double the um, representative population, Worcester City population of people under 18. Um, we reach about the same proportion in working age population. Um, and surprising to us, actually, we reached about 7% less than the representative population of 65 plus. I say that because anyone who's uh, engaged with our services knows through Stack and Chat, through Extend, through the, um, the Widows uh, Community Leg Group that we have, actually, it feels like the most visible population within our activity. Um, there's a sort of crude estimate that perhaps we reach about 10,000 people on footfall and about 4,500 through direct um, engagement with our services or partner services at our centres or out in the community. So this is who we reach. Um, and really, this is to, whilst we think of the hubs as neighbourhoods, and we are local neighbourhood organisations, and I engage with you as councillors in that respect, we're a citywide organisation. Um, we reach across the city, obviously the clusters and the warmer uh, colours are around the, the um, positioning of the centres, 
you'd start to see last year that, um, that we start to reach countywide with more and more targeted specialist services. That tends to be our domestic abuse service. We have now got two contracts countywide through both our women's re-empowerment and our domestic abuse service, which are separate. So you will see that spread out a little bit more um, over the next year. Okay, I leave these to speak for themselves, but the, the sort of attention I want to bring really is in those connectors to statistic, 41% of the participant took on a role or responsibility in the project. So that's people who came to access the service, started volunteering or started leading a project themselves. Enjoy 71% of people uh, completed training, uh, boosting their confidence, getting them more access to new things. And again, this is uh, the domestic abuse. This is Dawn, a Dawn project. I think I want to draw your attention to the 27% at the bottom, number of children with a reduced risk of entering the social care system. Um, in the pay and the price, uh, Report from the Review of Social Care it calculates that lifetime costs of a child with a social worker is about £720,000 per child. If that child enters um, the full care system, like it becomes a looked after child, that increases to about £1.2 million per child. So when we're looking at that 27%, 27% the social return on investment there is in the millions in just that statistic alone for, for Worcester Community Trust. So these are skills and training. These are slightly lower than we probably would have anticipated, but coming out of COVID um, last year, this is where we were at with it. Um, to give you a target for you know, 2025, it's gonna be more like 1,200. So we're sort of on that trajectory towards that. And again, um, this is through our job coaching. Um, on that last slide, um, one of the things, we, oh, excuse me. One of the things this didn't include is all the training and certificates that people access through the Domestic Abuse Joy and Connectors project, which, as I said in the previous statistic, is also really high. So, this is our job coaching. We have four job coaches through the BBO program, which is a UK wide, but we're, we're part of the county wide program from Community Housing. Really great statistics in here about conversion rates. Um, these are some of the people furthest away from the jobs market. These are people who are almost entirely off the radar. Um, and as you can see, some of those, again, sort of talk to the complex issues and the type of people we reached. I had one of you talking at the beginning about the nooks and crannies of Worcester and really like this is where Worcester Community Trust gets to. So this is our um, youth and play to, to, to kind of talk about why play finishes at 12, the way I understand play play is under 12, youth kind of kicks in at around 12. Um, fairly evenly balanced between who we reach. To talk about the, the 70, give some context to the 75% of the participants eligible for premium school meals. We are, where are we in Worcester? 22.5% of the UK, sorry, uh, are eligible for school meals. So we are reaching a really high proportion of from low income families and supporting them. Again, with the special educational needs in the UK, that's at 4%. We're reaching double that through our natural activity. These aren't specialist programs. And child poverty in Worcester is uh, 17%. So if you combine some of these statistics, particularly, particularly the care plans at the bottom and the eligibility for school meals, we're reaching a really high percentage of people who are experiencing um, poverty and child poverty. And this is just, a, again, it's, I think for every pound that you invest directly as Worcester City Council, um, seven pounds is, is, is returned. And again, on that monetary, not on that social return on investment, from our volunteer hours, a, an extra 50,000 pounds is created um, from that excess, not to mention the social impact that that creates. Um, so I guess I will finish on, I'll be back next year to update on this year, but just to give you an update of where we're at, we're actually looking to um, finish on about 1.5 million again. Our expenses are roughly the same. The deficit this year is forecast to be about 7,000 pounds. So we're doing really well this year. There was a surplus last year that was carried over, but most of that was through projects that hadn't been mobilized due to the slow uptake of COVID. We're now delivering 
most of those and into new contracts. Um, and so I'm going to move on to the outline business plan, which has been distributed. Um, you should have also received the budget documents and a strategic sort of outline of how the, the first year in more detail, but how the quarters really look on objectives. Um, so it's to outline the purpose of WCT over the next three years. As I mentioned, I've only recently started. Um, the four-year strategy, which was more broad, was uh, committed to in this committee in July 21. So it builds on that strat strategy. I haven't reinvented it, um, but we are in a new context. We have moved out of COVID and we've moved into rising costs and recession. Um, an underpinning sort of line for the whole thing is about how we can incrementally increase trading income through our skills and training and center hire to meet the additional costs, but also to be more resilient, particularly around the centers um, to funding cycles. Um, we want to maintain investment in communities at a neighborhood level um, and offer a bit of stability through competitive grant acquisition. Devolve power to communities by empowering them to design and influence services, activities in their immediate environment. Um, whilst we are the sole contractor of the positive activities contract, which means by acting in collaboration, we will get a diminished proportion of that. We've set some equal and competitive goals about fundraising um, for our youth service. And really, we want to be a lead youth service in the city. We're one of the sole providers at the moment. And we want to strengthen that and pour, put more focus around the outcomes in there rather than just attendance. But really, the, the, the guiding line on that one is how young people speak highly of us. You know, that will be the measure. Um, and we want to increase their voice in the city. So I'm going to go through these in brief. Um, they are in detail in the, in the business plan. Um, but developing the training arm and skills, we've got the one point, well, the beneficiary of the 1.9 million pounds town fund uh, investment. So we'll be getting building block ready, which is our construction skills school to take on the expansion into Dines Green. Um, we will increase level three qualification attainment in the city. We will build more opportunities for ourselves, working with the housing, employment, training and building sectors. We'll expand on our one-to-one -one advice uh, in harder to reach communities to support with energy, finance and job support. That's already underway. Many of these things are already underway. Um, and we will also improve uh, continued professional development and upward mobility for the staff and the trust. Devolving powers to communities. Um, we will connect people with power to enable them to design and influence decision making. Um, we've already had you guys over to the Young Leaders Programme over at Horizon, which is a sort of start of some of that work. Um, we will work with groups with shared characteristics, be that locality, age, ethnicity, and identity, uh, to build their collective voice and enable them to affect more change in the city. And we will continue to integrate asset-based community development as an ongoing practice. ABCD principles already in, are, invest, are spread through our organization. We have breakfast clubs in Dines and Tolly. Um, we have Bags of Lovely Ladies, which is a widows group in Wandon. Uh, we have a gardening group in Tolly, and we have multiple physical activities that are led, all led by communities. We've, we started them, we've empowered people, we've built their skills, they are now leading them, and we have removed ourselves. And we just occasionally put some resources towards them. Um, our domestic abuse and re-empowerment projects and, uh, are incredibly well run. Um, we just need to sustain and strengthen them. They are subject to the funding cycles, which do change, and there's no guarantees on them. But they're incredibly strong services. So really, this year, um, we'll just be trying to maintain the high performance of acquisition of funding and contracts. Increase engagement and relevant services for men. We're, in, uh, we're embedding a new uh, social impact monitoring system so that we can tell our stories a little better and also support funding. Um, and we're an also, also an, an active participant in the Integrated Care Systems uh, District Collaborative and VCSE Alliance, which is incredibly important. This is the big one, I guess, for us. And I've tried to put more detail in the business plan so it doesn't sound pie in the sky. Um, I've worked for four community centers where I've raised the revenue without damaging the impact. We, we increase the impact through what we do. Um, so I put some of the sort of broad strokes in the business plan, um, but welcome any questions around it. The 
the, the outlining guidance is to develop our approach to trading income and increase sources of contracts and grants to become a more financially diversified and resilient organization. The main areas um, will be increased skills and training and center higher income. We have a, an absolute commitment to trying to 100% uh, center overheads via trading income over five years, which is two years beyond this business plan, which includes the maintenance liabilities that you currently support, staffing and utilities. And we will develop a wider offer of cost effective community and BCSC training. This is, I guess, the context and part of the ask. Um, you currently support us with 75% of our internal maintenance costs. We pay 25%. My request is that we taper that off in a sort of structured way over five years. So that bottom line is from our 25% to 100% over five years. The big, thick blue line is energy costs. Um, it's, this is £52,000 this year. Um, it will go up to, I think, in year four on there, £171,000 for our centres. So our energy costs are over tripling. And then in the top, that's just staff increases that are both based on um, the sort of increased cost of them, but also as we grow, we will need more staff. So it just incorporates some of that. But what I also want to sort of show is actually we're not changing the shape of the finance, the financial shape of the organization. I think it's a 6% grow on the center income. Um, for building block is a 6% uh, increase. And then a small proportion is around the sort of donations that we take. So we just sort of, and also how we raise money through our activities. So there's not a massive shift of anything. It's not changing the organization. It's a gradual grow to move away from utter dependency on grants. that's the ask on that one um and i guess the other way that you support us is through our management grant as well which would be in the budget and in in the, in the request um so we've got two more goals three more goals so stick with me um implement strong organizational development and governments um all the economy has recruitment challenges at the moment the community sector has always been a hard thing. It's not an aspirational area, a, a aspirational sector, but it's, a, it's one that people really commit to once they get there. And there's huge amounts of actualization and benefit from them being there. But we are suffering from a lot of change at the moment with regards to that. And I think that's seen across most sectors. Um, so we want to strengthen ourselves and prepare ourselves for future growth as an organization. We've also grown by about half a million pounds, I think, and you'll know better than I, probably over the past three, four years. So we're at that point where we need to steady that growth and put a bit more structure into the organization. So that will be an area of concern. Expand on the skills and representation already present on the board. We do have a great board, as most of you will know, and they're highly skilled and embedded in the Worcester life. Um, and improved uh, staff training, performance management, consultation, and celebration into all our practices. Work with our partners to invest in our assets. You will mostly know about the, the Towns Fund, um, so it would be around the successful delivery of our Towns Fund um, capital project. There is a youth investment fund that's currently active at the moment. You guys won't be directly be able to access it as a local government, but you can through us. I think whilst that's still on the table, um, we probably need to have a conversation and decide whether we want to approach that with the Towns Fund going at the same time. Um, but that will enable us in, I think, five of the centres to create a multi-purpose. Um, it, it will invest in the youth centres that we could use in the daytime for other social activity. And there's millions of pounds available. Um, Worcester Community Trust will fund and, uh, a concept design for a full centre refurbishment with stakeholder consultation. Um, and in order for these things to happen, we need to start a discussion about lease extension, um, with, particularly with regards to the if we decide to go for the year fund. And then bold statements to become the lead youth organization in the city. Um, we focus on 18 to 16 year olds is the idea. Um, focusing on the emotional health and resilience of young people. It's about equality of access for young people to educational, personal and leisure opportunities. We want the measure to be young people speaking highly of our activities and we represent young people's voice in the city. And we are developing skills from within, engaging with young people, training them to become staff and developing the next generation of youth, youth leaders. 
So that's it. So it's open to you guys for questions. Thank you, John. I'll take uh, open it up to the floor, Councillor Cleary. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was actually going to um, email this question to John in advance, and I apologise that I didn't. That's fine. Um, it's regarding um, point four in Appendix Two, the, the financial plan, um, about the financially sustainable model. Um, I, when I read this and I saw that there was 1.2 million in unbooked space and half of your daytime slots run are not used, two thirds of evening and weekend, that looks to me to be horrifically inefficient. Um, and I think that given that we're being expected to foot 75% of the costs, um, I understand you've got an aim to reach 25% of this over five years. To me, that looks nowhere near bold enough yeah. um, to fix this. Um, I would appreciate if we were given quarterly figures on this when we see you in 12 months' time, because yep. this looks like a massive hole to fill. Yeah. Can That's, we do that, please? Yeah, absolutely. 1.2. I, I don't, and I know you do really good work there, because I've, 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 I've been there and I've had a look, but this looks to me that we need to keep an eye on this, yeah, rather than letting this go for five years. It's a, there's a huge opportunity there, um, and I do get what you mean. But it's not we're not a letting business as such. It's one aspect of what we do in order to fuel the social work, that we, the socially impactful work we do. So we, if we, say we maximise that, we've got 100 percent of that 1.2 million pound. It will come at the expense of other things, and so like it will come at the expense of the activity that's going on in that place. So it, the 25 percent was sort of like looking at something that was measured that can be directed towards clients such as the NHS, such as other business to business organizations that can create um, socially impactful activity that's beneficial to the residents in the area without sort of just maximizing that aspect of our, that, that complete focus of our business on generating income through that. But with regards to the quarterly reports, we meet monthly, we've got KPIs, you're, you're invited to the board meetings, um, which all of these things are reported in and measured. Would you ever made? <laughs> so these things are reported, and we also have um, members of the council, both from both parties, who are uh, what do we call them, observers. So we've got measures in place. I don't think it's as um, dramatic as that sounds um, with regards to it, and we do need to take those steps towards. I agree. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Lewin? Um, I've got a question. It's not really for you, actually. It's obviously seeing the rise in energy costs for the buildings. Are we as a council doing something to make sure that these buildings are as energy efficient as possible to reduce the pressure on the service? Thank you. Yes. John? Um, so we work really closely with Worcester City Council. Um, we are on your asset management plan, like your, your maintenance renewed plan. We've had a lot of, say, like PIRs, uh, so the, the sensors which turn lights on and off, um, implemented in the most busy areas within, that was last year, within the, that budget, the rest of that work is planned in. Um, we've also been doing stuff on a sort of behavioural level, like speaking with staff, making sure that things are changed internally. And they're relatively new buildings, like the, they, they, they could require more smart, more accessible smart controls so that we can program it around the bookings that are in the centres. Um, but apart from that, like quite a lot of the bigger strokes, so the fact they're only, you know, the buildings were probably built in what, 2010, 2005? Quite a lot of them feel relatively new. Um, but they're, by comparison to a lot of community centres, like the last one I worked in was 100 years old. And the, the, we have solar panels on bits. So Building Block um, does have solar panels on it. With regards, Warden also has some on it. Um, but I don't know about them throughout. Okay, do we have any other questions regarding it? No? Okay, I've got a couple of questions for you, John. One, um, I mean, uh, recognising a lot of the strategy was developed under your previous predecessor, so uh, some of the credit should, I suppose, go to Ruth in terms of uh, getting, to, getting you or handing over um, the building blocks that were for you to kind of build on for, for forgive the fun. Um, one of the things that I think Councillor Cleary mentioned was regarding 
approach for forecasting around room bookings and it not always being realistic from the impression that I got from what you, your answer was saying is that it would be more inefficient for you to pursue getting the rooms filled uh, uh, because it means that an opportunity will be lost elsewhere. Is that correct? It's, I guess it's a balance with what staff and capacity we have in the organisation and how, that's, how that energy of our organisation is focused. And so there is a danger when you maximise any room bookings in a centre, particularly in a community centre, that you're blocking community activity from taking place. And you have to be, it's about what clients you're getting. So we're, one of the changes, I guess, from previous um, strategies, approaches, is rather than getting your Worcester Bosches in and everyone where the quality of the centre doesn't necessarily match the client and it comes with some problems, what you're trying to do is make sure the people you're booking the centre, such as like the NHS or Freedom Leisure or whoever it is, some, some larger funders, some bigger fish than ourselves, <coughs> booking out a regular slot per week over the year. Um, one invoice, £10,000 rather than £100 invoices. Trying to get the type of clients that will create social impact. And so I guess it's not an inefficiency. Like if you want to maximise the income from that at the expense of doing the other work around it, then that's, that's what could happen. It could exclude other activity from taking place. Okay, no, thanks for clarification. I think I, I get the point into it. <laughs> The social cost of um, the communities that you're trying to serve, as opposed to the income that you're trying to generate to provide for reputation. So that kind of balance itself out. The second question was around devolved power in the communities. Um, when is that likely to happen? Is it happening? Is there a launch plan? How do local members get involved in their local community centres in order to, for, so to promote that? and? Um, get the word out on the street? So most of that's happening and it happens through our services. So if I give you an example, say from Joy, which is the Women's Reempowerment Project, it's about facilitating steering groups where they're designing and influencing the decisions about the service that's made for them. Um, when we met with the young leaders at Horizon, it's about bringing like Alan and Warwick, people who can affect the ideas from those young groups who you work with, um, into those conversations. So these things are already taking place. And I guess there, there isn't a launch idea of it. Like it's, 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 a, it's a slow process of enabling people to lead on activity themselves. And so those things are already happening and it's about building those up. We've also had specific community builder roles, um, which you also have in the council. We've got a sort of a, a, a short extension to it, but the currently, until further notice, those finish in March. So keeping this on the agenda is about building it into our processes as an organisation, rather than having to rely on a community engagement worker or a community builder or a community activist, depending on what sort of route of ABCD you're looking at. So um, councillors are involved, I guess, in, I mean, Pencils are involved in the activity that take place, like the neighbourhood kitchens, the evolution of that. So the neighbourhood kitchens is a um, home cooked meal that took place as a three week pilot in the lead up to Christmas. It was organised uh, as a partnership between different organisations, St Paul's, ourselves, Toledine Mission, Community Church, it was supported by your funding. Um, and the idea with that one is we provide at the beginning, but we remove ourselves and we skill up the volunteers to start taking the things they think are in, things that they've said are important that they want to see continued. And we slowly pull ourselves away from it once they're confident self running organizations. So they, they are running and you're all welcome to come to the ones that are publicly open um, and you're all welcome as you already do supporting through your councillor's grants, um, because quite often they will stimulate some of that initial activity. Final question. In, um, you said some of the Youth Investment Fund, the Horizon Youth Club wasn't eligible. Was there a particular reason for that? Yeah, it's not in an area um, that's eligible because of the um, income bracket, I guess, the, the, the indices of multiple deprivation. It's, it's not in the right decile for it, so it doesn't feature on the list. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for the report and 
So yeah, I was a little bit taken aback when you were offering to give us more money back and actually ask for some money. So we are more than welcome to approve that straight away. <laughs> and, um, and you hope that it can, I mean, um, can we, are we happy to take the recommendations on block? Agreed. Thank you, John. We appreciate your time and your patience. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, you, you introduced um, uh, David earlier, David Rushton from, from SLC. So, so once I've finished uh, my, my presentation, I'll ask David just to um, fill in any gaps that I've, uh, that I've missed uh, or, or provide some context to, to anything. Chair, as part of the presentation, I, I, I will offer you to break um, for a, a private conversation. Uh, we've got some private appendices as part of, of this report, so members and, and yourself may want to break um, to ask some questions and allow, and allow, allow me to present some uh, additional information which may be useful. Um, so, just to recap, uh, September meeting, um, Policy and Resources Committee approved £255,000 worth of funding um, to support Freedom Leisure with uh, additional in year uh, energy costs. Um, and at that time and in that report, we, we inform members that the, the energy costs for 23-24 were likely to be uh, in, in excess of £500,000. Freedom have now confirmed that the figure for next year will be uh, closer to £585,000. Um, at that time, as our members will recall, that um, there was uh, thought given to Freedom submitting a, a fee and charge increase, um, but that was withdrawn um, based on, on officer advice. Um, but we did inform members that Freedom were likely to come back uh, with a uh, fee and charge uh, proposal for, um, for April the 1st uh, onwards. Um, that will be in the region of 13 to 15% to be able to offset those additional costs faced. Um, members made it clear at that meeting um, that continuing to fund Freedom at 100% um, subsidy wasn't a sustainable position. Um, and you asked us to, uh, to go away and review um, the, 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 contract, uh, the contract arrangement. Uh, and, and, and doing so, we, we appointed uh, SLC to, to undertake that work for us. And, and SLC's report is provided in full, uh, a private appendix one. Um, the, the work SLC have done uh, was basically broken down into, into five sections. So they've given some information on what the national state of the ledge sector is. Uh, they've undertaken a financial assessment of the contract. Um, they've assessed some cost reduction proposals being put forward by Freedom. They've appraised uh, a number of management options, including what it would cost the council to deliver the service in-house um, or through an arm's length uh, arrangement. Um, and there's also a small section around uh, contract extension proposals. So in respect to the national state, the leisure sector, um, obviously still recovering from, uh, from the pandemic. Um, and as a result, many leisure contracts which aren't receiving uh, local authority support, they're running at loss. Um, and uh, you will have seen in the press that many smaller leisure trusts have actually gone out of business or, or at real risk of going out of business. Um, on top of the pandemic recovery, uh, we then had cost of living crisis. And what, what that has done is pushed up uh, the energy price uh, in, in particular for, for leisure, but has also meant that people have less disposable income uh, to spend on leisure. So that's also uh, impacted uh, income received by, by, by Freedom. Um, and um, the, the work SLC do across the country um, that insight um, shows that uh, there are no public authority leisure contracts that have, re that have returned to pre-pandemic um, performance levels. Um, and that's leading to either operators or councils carrying those additional costs or taking on additional risk. Um, and whereas um, many contracts were receiving, um, the, sorry, that the local authorities were receiving a, a, an income by way of a management fee, um, many, if not all of those councils are now providing a subsidy. So it's been a total swing in, in, in contract position. Um, just in respect of um, Worcester's uh, recovery, um, I think we've reported to members previously that swimming has, has bounced back remarkably well, um, surpassing uh, pre-pandemic levels of demand. However, um, SLC's report in particular has shown that health and fitness, um, which is the main income stream for, uh, for freedom, that remains well below pre-pandemic levels. So Nunnery Wood, um, slowest to recover 55%, St John's performed best at 72%, and Perth as well somewhere, uh, somewhere in the middle. Um, the financial assessment of the contract, um, SLC reviewed uh, Freedom Ledger accounts for previous years and compared that to 2021. Um, and in effect, what they did was to um, develop a, a, a shadow bid, which uses estimates uh, based on, uh, on, on, on those years and the income and expenditure uh, information uh, provided. Um, paragraph 2.16 um, sets out some of the key findings uh, of that shadow bid assessment, some of the, the assumptions and, and, and that, that were used. Um, further information, Chair, is contained at paragraphs uh, one to six of the private appendix two. And at that point, um, that's probably where I'd offer you and members to break into, into private session um, so we can dis discuss some of those points further. It is now. It is now. Yeah. Are we going to, are we okay to go into closed session? Members happy to do that.
these proposals. Um, several were put forward by, by Freedom, which were appraised by, by SLC, um, and that was a mix of reduced operating hours, um, removal of one post, um, some capital investment in, in renewable energy, um, and closure of one site. Now, this report is recommending to members that um, two of those proposals um, that relate to reduced operating times at Perth as well and Nunnery Wood um, are, are approved. Um, and that would have the uh, combined effect of, of reducing uh, costs by, by £40,000 a year. Um, and the expectation is that all of that uh, would go to offset the additional cost of energy um, next, next year. Um, paragraph 2.20 just outlines the key elements um, of those proposals. So for Nunnery Wood, uh, a reduction of 33 operating hours across a week. Um, and for Perth as well, a reduction of five operating hours. Um, and uh, we asked Freedom Measure to just to deep dive into that a bit, um, just to make sure that there were no particular groups of protected characteristics that were being impacted, and they've confirmed um, that, that there hasn't, uh, and, and, and there won't be. Um, the next section is around capital investment uh, in, to increase use of renewable energy. Uh, and we've set out there in the table, paragraph 2.22, um, some of the work that Freedom have, have already taken. And one of those uh, relates to Councillor McKay's point around reduction of pool temperatures. Um, but back last year, Freedom commissioned a study uh, in, into this area um, for, for the three Worcester sites. Um, and those proposals are included in a bit more detail at, at Public Appendix 2. Um, they included light improvements, uh, pool pump controls, air handling units, solar technology and heat pumps. Um, having considered the report um, and, and discussed further with, uh, with Freedom, um, what we are proposing is to take forward the, uh, the lighting improvements at each of the three sites, the pool pump controls at Perth as well, and the air handling units at St John's, um, and solar panels uh, at each of the three sites as well. So the proposal is to, is to progress those um, when we have a full business case that's brought back to, to, to committee. Um, the total capital investment would be around £550,000, um, and that's broken down uh, in the table um, at uh, paragraph 2.25 um, uh, around the, uh, the, the, the savings that would result in um, and the, the carbon reduction and the energy reduction. Um, and if all those works were, were carried out, um, that would result in a further £147,000 worth of savings um, uh, per year. Um, at this stage, um, we, we're not suggesting we progress with the, the air heat pumps, um, because even though they reduce gas consumption at each of those sites, um, but the way electricity costs are at the moment, uh, it's just not, uh, it wouldn't be cost effective uh, to, to, to do that. Um, and as I say, what, what this report is recommending is for, uh, for committee to um, recommend a, um, a capital allocation of £550,000, but that will be subject to a full detailed business case coming back to this committee um, for, for, for release, of that, release of that money. Um, on to management options appraisal, so, so SLC looked at the, the comparative costs of delivering uh, the service in-house um, or through a local authority trading company um, and um, the, um, the, the outcome of that um, is uh, contained in, in, in the paragraphs uh, 231 to 233 um, and that clearly showed that um, the way the contract is operated currently is the, is the cheapest way of doing it, the most cost effective way of doing it. If we were to uh, bring the service back in house, it would, it would actually cost us over £1.1 million a year um, to, provide, uh, to provide leisure services across the three sites of the Active Communities Programme. Um, and if it was done through a local authority trading company, it would, it would cost in the region of £700,000. So there's a clear distinction there in cost between, uh, between the way in which the service is, is delivered. Um, We've included um, some information at 237 and 238 around uh, the, um, a, a, a potential contract proposal. Um, we have started to have conversations with Freedom as a valued partner, and I think members have always valued the, the services they, they, they deliver. Um, but I think the, the gist of that is there's, there's much more conversation to be had, and the focus really is around supporting Freedom with next year's energy costs and what we can do to reduce those costs. So um, anything further on that would be brought back to this committee uh, at, at the appropriate time. Um, the last element is around uh, the fee and charge proposal. This is included at Appendix 3 of the report. Um, and, and in short, um, the, the proposal in front of the members is to uh, increase fees and charges across all activities um, at an average of 8.8%. Um, paragraph 241 lists those uh, activities where, where no uh, price increase is being applied. 
Um, and then we've just set out in some of the paragraphs um, some of the uh, price increases across um, various different services. Members will note that the, um, the highest increases are um, uh, around swimming. Um, and I think from an officer point of view, we feel that's justified because that's where the highest uh, energy costs are. Uh, and those services probably cost, or probably will, will, will cost more, more to deliver. Um, and just to point out um, one headline grabbing uh, increase, which is 100% increase for over 75 swimming, um, just to rest assure members uh, at the moment, um, if you're over 75, you pay £10 to swim every day of the week um, at Perd as well pools. So that's extremely good value. Um, and the proposal is that that gets increased to £20, 20 pound rather than £10. Um, so I know 100% is, is, a, is, a, is a drastic percentage increase, but in, but in real terms, um, it's still uh, very good value. And if members were to approve um, the fees and charges um, uh, for, for onward um, to, to income management committee and through the budget setting process, that would raise um, £230,000 of additional income. And again, the expectation is that would simply offset um, the additional um, cost of energy for, for, for next year. Um, Chair, I'm conscious of time, um, so I will probably um, stop there, other than to say the combined um, impact of um, the reduction in um, operating hours across the two sites um, and the uh, additional income uh, raised through um, uh, uh, additional revenue um, offsets that £585,000. Um, but obviously still leaves a gap of uh, £315,000. I suppose the key proposal in this report tonight is that the Council continues to provide um, that level of support to freedom up to £315,000 uh, £315, um, and to continue doing that via the open book arrangement that we've, we've currently got. So that money is only drawn down um, as and when we know um, that, that, um, that, that, that subsidy is, is, is required. So I'll probably stop there um, and, and hand over to, uh, to, to, to you for, for any questions. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, I'll open up to the floor, Councillor Hodgson and Councillor Cleary. Um, I'd just like to just um, query 2.54, um, sorry, 4.5, um, which is um, a proposed increase in schools swimming fees. Um, now, schools are um have uh, i've got have got um real pressures on their budget and um i wonder whether this is really the best thing to do because um schools are and uh, many schools really do um after covid and everything um They've uh, they've started to swim again and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering. Yeah, I, I think the point I'd go back to um, chair is probably the point around um, um, operation of of the pool is probably the the highest user of energy and probably the most costly service to to, to provide. So I think from an officer point of view, we are comfortable that um, the higher increases are, are are there. Not something that we we, we need you know we, we we want to do, but but. but I think that that's the, that's the position we're in, um, and appreciating that, that there will be a cost to the school. Um, you know, uh, I suppose the, the, the saving grace is that there's, there's no cost to the user, um, which which are the children. But um, um, you know, I'm not here to defend Freedom's proposal. That this 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 is their proposal, but that will be the the officer view. And I suppose have they have you had any conversations in, with, with schools about a possible increase? I'm just thinking that it's it's particularly um, particularly around um, pupils of, of yeah. We need to check with freedom chair, but I, I'm not aware of conversation with schools like this. Okay. Councillor Cleary, then of Councillor Ali, and then Councillor Stephen Hunt. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, it's uh, 2.44 I wanted to mention. I know we've spoken about this before, about um, over 75 swim passes. Um, I, I can't really see the logic in this. We've just been told that the group that hasn't come back to the leisure centre is the over 70s and over 75s, and now we're doubling the cost for them to swim. Um, and when we talked about this before, 
I think we learned that there was only a couple of hundred people with an over 75 swim pass in the whole city. And let's say there's 200 of them, well, 200 lots of 10 pound. It's a drop in the ocean, it's pointless. Ab absolutely pointless. When we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. I, I, I just can't see the point of doubling an over 75 swim pass for an extra 10 quid per person. Do we know the uh, numbers? I, I'll just check with Alan. We, we, we don't have the numbers um, with us tonight. We can we can go away and we can go away and find them. Um, but again, chair, you know, I'm, I'm not here to defend Freedom's proposal, but it, it's extremely good value um, to be able to swim every day of the week in a high class. Well, actually, were Freedom supposed to be here tonight? No. Alan. Yeah, if, if I can just add on the back of that, though, that um, since the contract commenced in um, December 2015, the fee for that particular activity of over 75 swimming hasn't been increased in, in that period. So this would be the first increase since the start of the contract. I understand that completely, but the amount of money that's going to be raised by doing this, I don't think justifies another reason to push over 75s away from going back to exercise you could you could times their their swim pass by 10 if you wanted it's a drop in the ocean and you're stopping the over seven it's another reason to stop over 75s going back to the legislature i i, I think it's bonkers Councillor lamb here because we've already had two suggestions that this that we we don't agree with this increase we don't agree with this increase and that may be very true but you know is our role here can we actually say well we don't agree with this and therefore but then surely this would have to go back to freedom and leisure and freedom and leisure would have to recrunch all the statistics wouldn't they so is our role here to approve the whole thing or disapprove or what, what is our role because they're almost coming some suggestions from other members that we don't agree with individual um, items in the so what, what can we do, if anything? Shane, Shane may wish to clarify, but, but the role of this committee, um, I, I think we've, we've got ourselves into, into a bit of a pickle before by not bringing fees and charges to the relevant policy committee for you to, for you to be able to scrutinise them, which is, is, is exactly what you're doing. Um, the role of this committee and, and what, you've been, what you've been asked to do is to, is to refer um, this um, uh, on to uh, Income Management Committee um, for their approval. So if there are things that you aren't um, particularly uh, um, supportive of, um, then I think in the time scales we've got available to be able to do something with freedom, I, I, I can't commit to that leading to a change. What we can do as part of the referral report is flag up where this committee, you've got, I've, got, I've got real concerns. <coughs> is that, I, I don't know the no, change. I, I, I think I disagree with that. No. I mean, I think our, our, our role is actually, we can make those suggestions. They will go to income generation, and if income generation then don't recommend them, they go to PNR, and if PNR can overrule um, income generation and then go whichever way they want, but we are allowed to make um, alterations and suggestions. It's perfectly clear within our remit to 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 make those changes, and if members feel that that they want to propose that, please propose that. Just to add to that, yes, the, the constitutional process is that the, the Income Management Committee is responsible for making recommendations to Council on fees and charges. But it, we, we, in the spirit of, of uh, approach that we have towards budget setting is to create as many opportunities as possible for people to comment, present their views, make recommendations through that process so that we can collate all those by the time we get to policy and resources. We have a full set of views as to what should and shouldn't be recommended. So it will be down to income management committee next week to determine whether to make recommendations through to policy and resources. And of course, the primary committee is the council itself. So anything that is presented from policy and resources to full council, you will again have the opportunity to consider them and make recommendations before they're actually included in the budget. So we're just trying to provide as much opportunity for everybody to contribute their thoughts and ideas in this process before we as we work it through the constitution 
to the final budget stage. Okay, so we will represent your views at Income Management Committee next week. So we don't need to propose anything. This will get fed back. Is that what we're saying? Uh, I, I think the proposal here from you, Owen, or joint from us, is that we disagree with the increase in the £10 charge and that actually that is offset that is offset by an increase in subsidy from us to cover that offset is that right and um, through you chair uh, I, there's no direct implication in terms of the budget at this stage but what i'm what i'm what i'm suggesting what i'm the process which i think we're trying to work through is that if you're making observations here i will record those we will take note of them and make sure that the income management committee receives that feedback in making its own decision okay as it happens the chair and vice chair of income management committee are here this evening so they'll be able to do it without my assistance but that is the formal process points to be considered as well Yep. Please. Are there any other suggestions that you want to make? Obviously, take Councillor Bash Ali next because he was down to speak. On their website. It, the current website looks really boring. Um, in, in our city, you've got four fitness centres and gyms. If you, they advertise and if you open their website, it gives you options to choose whatever suits you. But this one, free of year, you have to fill the form in and one of the staff has to ring and spend about 15 minutes over the phone and talk to different options and there's a noise in the background I have experienced myself. And then by the time you think, oh, leave it. If we put the prices up, I think we will encourage more people to just do direct debit and join through the website at the moment there's no process to join online you have to ring or you have to fill the form in they contact you back it's really old style we can feed that back can't we i mean this i mean alan do you want to step in quickly yes thanks for the feedback we'll, we'll have that conversation with them i think that generally across the leisure operators the standard model they tend to use is to direct people through the application process because then that dialogue with the member of staff from the information that they glean determines which is the best membership option for that particular individual so rather than put a raft of membership charges up on the website because as you can see from the fees and charges document there is a host of of options available that they do it that way because they find it is more concise for the person that's making the application rather than leaving them with a whole raft of information to go through okay councillor stephen hodgson Yes, just a general comment really about the overall increases in um, charges generally. Um, obviously, the purpose behind this, the rationale is, um, is to get this service um, to be basically be able to pay for itself by using a combination of um, making the buildings, the estate, far more energy efficient than that. Um, changing some practices that will reduce cost um, and obviously um, hopefully to increase revenue by increasing um, fees and charges but obviously there's another side of this and this is have the officers considered the operators about the aspect of um, the elasticity of demand for such facilities that means, for example, if you increase the cost of something, you may find the demand for it actually falls because people decide, well, this particular aspect is now too expensive, or people will decide to actually downgrade their offering and go for a, a go for like less expensive options. So therefore, effectively, um, we don't achieve 
the actual revenue targets that we hope to actually achieve. That's the risk, and how well has that risk actually been considered? I think I think I think public leisure provision is you know is generally some of the cheapest provision out there, isn't it? And, you know, we, we we're not the only um, part of the leisure sector that will be looking at um, increasing um, fees and charges in order to to, to cover those costs. Um, prior to this, I think you know the information that we've always received from Freedom as part of our new report is that they've been very competitive, competitively priced. Um, but I may sort of turn to Alan or David for, for some sort of you know more, more regional or national context on this one, actually. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the way that the leisure contract was originally set up prior to, to COVID, you know, essentially the um, operator is taking all of the commercial risk and, and heavily incentivized to uh, maximize revenue. Um, and and they, they, they put in a very, quite a bold bid at the time where income levels were much, much higher than the, the previous operation aided by the new uh, the new developments at Perth as well but you know eff effectively you're you're bringing in an operator that you know operates uh, all, all over the country they have marketing resources social media resources people who are targeted to maximize income you're, you're bringing them in to to worry about that to worry about the commercial risk um, side of things Unfortunately, where you are with the contract at the moment is that um, you're in this deficit funding position um, where, you know, because of COVID and um, the energy costs. So, you know, you're, you're starting to sort of look at that, that side of things again. I mean, ultimately, um, depending on, you know, what, what comes back from Freedom in terms of future proposals, potential contract extension, the council can get back into a position where it gets a, a fixed management fee and that the operator is taking on the risk. There'll, you know, there'll, be, there'll be some caveats around you know, en energy benchmarking, as I mentioned earlier. Um, operators can't take the risk on that going forward. Um, and if anything else bad happens, um, but you know, the, the council will be able to get back to a, to a position where you've got a fixed management fee for a duration albeit it won't be as high as where you were before but you know es essentially you've 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 commissioned a na national operator to to take on that commercial risk and, and actually uh, what i term sweat the asset it's their job to to sweat the asset and um, maximize income so um, you know hence hence some of the things that alan was saying around the way that they manage memberships uh, uh, in terms of um, you, you have you, you have a customer advisor which basically assesses the needs of a particular customer and what membership solution is best best for them. Now, now that's fine as long as um, they've got plenty of resources for, for those memberships. So you know, it's essentially, it's up to the operator to to maximise income within within the constraints of the contract. And if they're you know if they're if they're proposing a particular price. Um, they they will have thought about it and researched it. The, the, the other thing is, is what, as well, uh, we're, in, we're in a situation where inflation's at double figures. So if they're if they're proposing an eight percent price increase, it's not it's a real term. It's not it's not a real terms increase. It, it, you know, it's just that you know the the charges have to sort of catch up with the inflationary position. So yeah, and it's tough because we've also got a cost of living crisis, but you know it's up it's up to your operator to maximize maximize the um usage and income of the facilities and sweat the asset if you like yeah i mean and, and that's a really good point david i mean and, and i think citizen housing when they were here as well in terms of their price increases and how they were trying to protect their customers from that inflationary rise and taking a hit from themselves no doubt Freedom will be taking a lot of hit in, in terms of that. So we've got to be really careful in terms of um, the impact of some of, of, you know, disagreeing too much in there, but it's perfectly within the rights of the committee to obviously suggest that. Um, are there any other speakers? I'll take Owen as the last speaker then for some of it. And Karen. Owen and Karen, that's it. Just, can someone just explain 2.43? Because I think there's a mistake 
from 2.43 with the numbers. I, if there isn't a mistake, then I don't understand it. Could someone explain it, please? Look, it looks like there is a mistake, Chair. But I, I, I need to go back to the um, the fee and charge proposal to um, to clarify that. So I, I can clarify that. Uh, but, but there's definitely a, there's definitely a typo there. Okay, Councillor Lewin. Uh, just quickly on the unsupervised activities, is PLC um, Perdswell Leisure Centre Perdswell Young? Is it something to do? You know, do the Perdswell Youth Service use the pool at all or the gym at all? You know the the the, the, the um, what I'm thinking of is you know when when we're using um, you know with the play service that we're using if they want to use PERD as well do they use it for free or is there an increase in cost for them if you see what I mean yes exactly so and, and and if they want to do if some if if a body like that wants to use PERD as well. I'm thinking about from the school point of view, if there's anybody else within like that kind of sector, would their costs go up as well? Yes, that's correct. The contractual obligation that Freedom have is to provide 104 free hours of use for Worcester Play Council, but any organisation beyond that that wants to hire the facility would pay the standard charge. Yeah, I think there's no escaping the fact that it's the circumstances the we find ourselves in in terms of the cost of living and inflation and all the other pressures that um, businesses, all in for all intensive purposes, are finding themselves under. So, you know, again, I refer back to challenging times and tough decisions. You know, uh, however, there are genuine concerns from from members in terms of that. And swimming is something close to my heart as. As members know, in terms of um, you know um, uh, the the original sorry service level agreement in terms of kids free quit swimming that I put into the into that contract and obviously doing uh, women's swimming as well. So whatever we can do to help the most vulnerable, I think I tend to kind of agree with it. And so on that note, I believe that the pro proposals Owen and Councillor Hodge um, Lucy were making need to be voted upon. Is that right? Or do you need a word, form of words? Through you, Chair. I think, do, you know, in having contemplated that for a while and had a discussion with Julian, it's probably appropriate that if members wish to uh, present a change in terms of those recommendations, then we could do that as, a, as a, a, um, an amendment to recommendation 1.6. So that would be uh, recommends the draft freedom, leisure, fees and charges with the exception of those items where members where the committee as a whole feels it doesn't want to accept the proposals um if you're happy to do that that would then invite councillors hodgson and, and cleary to um make those proposed changes and we'd need that to be uh, seconded and then as a committee to vote on it okay owen do you want to take the i'm, I'm happy to propose that the, the details in 244 and 245 are frozen rather than increased. Is that acceptable? I'll second that. Mm -hmm. uh, can we take a vote on that uh, pr proposal that um, under 1.6, that fees and charges for 2.5, was at 4.5 4 4.4 and 4.5 okay all okay. those so those proposed increases are not included two, two sorry two four, point two four, four, sorry 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 my computer's just crashed unfortunately <laughs> wouldn't you know it okay so are we clear of what we're yeah. voting yeah. Okay. all those in favor of that amendment three okay so that amendment is carried forward now we take Oh, sorry. Are there any objections to that proposal? Councillor De Sarah, that's against, right? Okay. Any abstentions? 
No. Fine. It's fine. So that, and then we take the whole item. Is that right? I wanted to check. Give me, give me the. Okay, so the, we'll take the recommendations one at a time. 1.1, 1. 1. all those in favor? Okay, so we're working on what, item 1.1, 1. 1, notes that the contents of this report, and in particular the additional £585,000 unbudgeted costs associated with the operating the contract 2023 to 2024, primarily relating to energy. All those in favour? Okay. Agreed. Recommendation 1.2 notes the findings of the leisure contract options appraisal undertaken by sports and leisure consultancy as set out in this report and within private appendix one. All those in favour? Agreed. 1.3 approves £40,000 annual cost reduction measures as specified at Appendix 1 for implementation as of April the 1st, 2023. All those in favour? Read. 1.4 recommends to Policy and Resources Committee a capital allocation of £550,000 to undertake energy efficiency works as specified within this report and includes at Appendix 2. All those in favour? Read. 1.5 notes that a further report setting out a full and detailed business case for the capital investment referred to in recommendation 1.4 will be presented back to this committee in June 2023. All those in favour? 1.6 as amended, as amended recommends that draft freedom leisure fees and charges 2023-2024 for approval to income generation management committee included in appendix three with the exception of 2.44 and 2.45 which remain the same all those in favor read 1.7 Recommends to Policy and Resources Committee the approval of up to £315,000 in financial support for 23-24 to Freedom Leisure, which has been built into the draft budget for 23-24. All those in favour? Read. 1.8. Notes that open book account meetings will continue to be held in order to reconcile the level of financial support required by Freedom Leisure up to the maximum value specified in recommendation 1.7 all those in favor agree thank you thank you david really appreciate your professionalism and your knowledge in and your time thank you item number 10 draft worcestershire Housing strategy, Tom, your time to shine. Time to... Trevor McDonald. 10 past 10, my time to shine. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll try and cover this um, you, uh, as quickly as I can. Um, uh, hopefully, members have had an opportunity to read the report uh, and associated uh, strategy uh, that's been included as an appendix. Um, just to give a bit of background, um, the process for um, developing the, the uh, Worcestershire homeless, uh, sorry, housing strategy um, beginning in um, 2021. Um, it's taken some time to um, arrive at the current position and to have a, a, a final draft document um, ready to be shared with, with members today. Um, a joined up approach was taken. Um, working with um, each of the seven Worcestershire councils, as well as wider partners, uh, such as the NHS, the, the LEP, um, and local housing providers in the development of the strategy. Um, and it takes, um, uh, the, the reason behind the strategy is to try and take a longer term vision and view of the, um, the issues surrounding housing. Uh, it's a non-statutory requirement. Uh, the local authority doesn't have to have one. 
um, as it does for a homelessness strategy. Um, but nonetheless, it provides um, a strategic direction of, of travel uh, and some objectives um, that we're seeking to achieve across the county. It's a 20-year strategy, uh, so it's a longer term. Um, uh, uh, it's a long, it provides a longer term vision um, and beyond um, some of our sort of local delivery plans that we would ordinarily adopt. And it recognises that decisions that we make today uh, will have a significant impact on housing and the outcomes that we'll have in the future. Uh, the strategy um, sets out the vision for housing in Worcestershire. Um, that is that Worcestershire will be known for excellent housing. Everyone will have choices about how and where they live. Local homes will be warm, healthy, and will lead the way towards net zero. Worcestershire housing will add to a better quality of life. Sets out that the vision will be delivered through four priority areas. Uh, they are economic growth and jobs, quality and standards, health and wellbeing, and net zero carbon and climate change. Uh, the proposal that um, we're presenting today um, is, is in recognition that Worcester faces significantly different pressures uh, in respect of housing by comparison to the rest of the county uh, and, and, and each of the other districts. Uh, that's due mainly uh, due to its ge geographical location and makeup, limitations in the supply um, and availability of, boarding, of affordable housing uh, and land constraints. Uh, the intention is to develop a Worcester City uh, count, a Worcester City action plan, um, following and being informed by public consultation, uh, which we intend to take undertake on this strategy. Uh, so, sub subject to approval of the report, uh, and on the basis that the strategy is approved by council at, at future point, um, the uh, and. Uh, performance and delivery of the strategy and Worcester City Action Plan uh, will be to the Communities Committee. There must be wider governance and ownership and delivery of the strategy across the county um, through three tiers. That's the Housing Strategy Monitoring Board, the Housing Board, and then there'll be task and finish groups um, focused on the delivery. The preferred option, um, as set out in the report, is to undertake an eight-week period of public consultation and that's in recognition of the um, the, the potential impacts um, uh, um, that this strategy will have for, for a significant period of time on on residents and stakeholders of Worcester City um, each of the other authorities uh, districts aren't aren't, in, under, aren't intending to undertake um, a uh, consultation, public consultation on the strategy, um, but it is our proposal to do so in recognising the impact, potential impact. But the intention is also to um, develop a Worcester City Action Plan as opposed to adopting the county-wide action plan. And again, that's, the, that's with the view of uh, retaining that focus on the pressures and priorities in the city. I'll, 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 Stop there. Uh, welcome any questions that anyone might have. Thanks, Tom. Um, Councillor Hodgson, Lucy Hodgson. I presume that um, this document is is um, is has uh, been um, examined by the Planning Policy Unit at Worcester City Council because obviously um, it. The uh, South Worcester Development Plan review is going ahead, so it's it should be it should be um, a, a a complementary document, really. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a complementary document. It, it, it doesn't it isn't impacted or doesn't affect the um, the um, South Worcester Development Plan. So um, it's been purposely sort of done to complement rather than. Um, replace or, or impact that, yeah. Do you have any other commentators or questions? Thank you. Uh, last, yeah, right, the last second. Go on, Councillor Cochrane. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, yeah, my question is just a, a overall question. Um, 
as you mentioned, um, your proposal is that we have a slightly different approach to other um, district councils. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what is the benefit to Worcester City of this housing strategy exercise, which, as you say, is not statutory. Um, what, what benefit is it going to bring to Worcester City? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, interesting point. I think the um, the benefits of it, it brings collaboration, so that it gives the opportunity for us to work collaboratively with, with other districts um, um, on shared visions and, and, and shared um, shared objectives, which we're agreeing to. We, we do um, support, we recognise that the um, strategic direction in the strategy is, is, is aligned to what we want to achieve in Worcester. Um, the big difference is around how we actually approach that and the delivery of that, which differs. Um, so working collaboratively um, across the county and trying to get that, um, uh, I suppose, the economy of scale working working together is is hopefully going to bring additional benefit to the city rather than having to do something standalone. Just, I mean, it's obviously not not uh, you know the, developing the strategy for Worcestershire is not you know a, a, it's a cost to the uh, county council mainly. Um, but I don't know. Just it seems like an exercise in paying consultants and consultancy firms lots of money for making predictions about what's going to happen in 2040, which is such a long way away that I don't think anybody could predict that. Um, and given that Worcester City is you know, in a different position from other districts, I, I'm, I'm just wondering what, you know, is, is it value for money, you know, um, you know, putting officer time and resources into this strategy document? Just, just uh, playing devil's, devil's advocate. <laughs> I, I, yeah, this, I can answer too. <laughs> of those part questions, I suppose. One, it absolutely is essential that our officers develop that Worcester City plan because the wider document doesn't really reflect Worcester City in it as well. Worcestershire, as you know, is you know 95% rural, you know, where the 5% urban and how it affects us. It doesn't really clearly outline that. A lot of the policy doesn't complement what we're trying to do here, although it helps, so it's really essential that, that officer time is spent in developing a a policy that's fit for us. Yeah, just very quick on it. It is an excellent document, actually, this um, strategy with some very interesting um, facts and things in it. But I think there's been an omission on page one six five or seventeen of the report with this wonderful table I thought of told you the difference between county council and district council what they actually do and they bother, haven't bothered um, putting the ticks or any marks in that particular table so it might be worth uh, whoever's responsible for the commission report just, just to go back and ask them to um, correct that I know we understand it um, but the layman might not or the lay person I should say <clears throat> Point noted. Any other com comments? Are we happy to take those recommendations? All agree? Agree. Thank you. Quarter three performance report. At this hour, Chair, I'll take the report as read. Actually, I want a fully comprehensive detail. I can, I can provide that chair. I can provide that chair if you wish. But <laughs> members may wish to vote on that. Okay. Uh, for the sake of time, then, do we have any questions on the quarter three performance report? Councillor Lewin. It's a 
I know my numbers are different to yours. Yeah. Yeah. My question is on the um, measure um, two on five, the number of children placed in B and B accommodation. Um, what I'm interested in is when you've got a target for something like this and you've got numbers, what I'm I would be really interested in is how long children are staying in B and B accommodation rather than the numbers. I don't know whether the 13 children in quarter one are still the 13 children in quarter two. And that actually goes with the temporary accommodation as well and other, and other elements. It's really that we're not having people stay in those kinds of types of accommodation longer than they need to. That's my point. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really valid point. Um, I, I think there's an opportunity to, to look at the performance indicators for the, for the coming year um, that we report to committee. Um, uh, I, I suppose I can't give the, the detail in terms of what that looks like now, but it's certainly something that we can, can look at. And, and you're quite right that some of the, some of the children that were in, in the previous quarter may well sort of, uh, sort of move over into the following quarter. Um, but it is something that we closely monitor and are, are aware of. So we have got that data and we have got that information to hand, but, um, um, which I can, I can feed back to you if that's of interest to you. And what we can do is part of the, the quarter four report, we can provide some narrative around that as part of the, as part of the commentary. Councillor Kai. Just on the grounds that I couldn't let Councillor Lewin be responsible for holding us all up. <laughs> Um, in relation to the number of antisocial behaviour incidents uh, that's gone down, is that as a result of them being recorded as crimes, which are now um, increased slightly? Chair, I'd, I'd have to get Warwick to, um, to provide a written, uh, a written answer to, to committee members on, on that one, because Warwick holds the, uh, hold, holds the detail. Yeah, that's a good question, mm. Steve, on that. It would be good to get some clarity. Councillor Lewin? I'm sorry, I did have a second question. It's the HMOs licensed. The current target is 75%, but you're consistently getting about 66%. So I'm just wondering whether you've got plans to do something different to actually change the, um, you know, reach the 75%, because it looked very consistent, 66 Thank you. Yeah, that, it, it's a question that comes up, I think, every, every committee um, around the HMOs. Um, the, the, the big, uh, the main factor is the, the, um, the total number of uh, HMOs uh, that we report on dates back to um, some quite historic data from 2015. Um, so it's not necessarily truly representative of exactly how many H HMOs there are um, comparable to the percentage. So it does, it is lower. Um, so, so it's something that we're doing the stock condition survey to try and get a better picture of um, what properties we have, the stock. Um, um, and um, we are doing quite some, some proactive work currently to try and identify more HMOs so where, they, so where we're not aware of them. We are doing work to try and identify them to bring that number up. Um, but you're right, it is a, it's unusually consi um, consistent. Um, but it is data that we check. Um, uh, prior to prior to submitting it to the committee. Anyone else desperate to ask a question? No. In that case, can we take recommendations or note the recommendations for the report? All noted. Thank you. Um, there haven't been any other items identified, which is good, and we've covered off the items involving disclosure information, which means that you can all go home. <laughs>